Hello YouTube, how is everyone doing? It's Professional here. Welcome back to my playthrough of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. So now, we're, I'm assuming we're on the final part of this trial. This trial is getting crazy, and hopefully now we finally get to some answers now. We find out what really happened in that pawn shop, and um, we prove Gina's innocence. So here we go, let's continue from where we left off. So this is McGilded's box. This is the box that he brought into that pawn shop. So this is the article in question, is it? The small box deposited with the pawn brokery by McGilded two months ago. And on the night of Mr. Windebank's murder, the only item on the shelf that was touched by whoever broke into the shop. <sighs> quick, quick, let's open it and see what's inside. What is this thing? Some kind of device. This is no ordinary box, it seems. Wow. Although, in truth, I had an inkling that might be the case. It would appear that the box houses a miniature music box movement. Then, is it too much to expect? I think it would be reasonable to assume that it is a device for the playback of this disc, my lord. Let's play the disc! So, here we have the means to play back Mr. McGillard's disc deposit at Windebanks at much the same time. Not strictly correct, my lord. It was not McGillard's disc. It was the disc of his victim in the omnibus. But why, for heaven's sake, are we to understand that the brickmaker was trying to sell this music box disc to Mc M Mr. McGillard? I believe the answer will become clear if we listen to the music on the disc, my lord. Yes, very well. Let the court now listen to this curious disc at last. Wait, my lord. Good grief. What is the meaning of this, Inspector? The Inspector knows what's on it. There's government secrets on it. It's probably in Morse code. That's what I think, because a, a, a disc like that, it wouldn't really have anybody's voice on it. You know, it's, it just plays based on the tiny bumps on the disc. So it's not like discs in today. This is like, you know, well over 100 years ago. Um, so I think there's Morse code playing that plays government secrets because if we take a look at the newspaper here, remember it says article about government secrets being leaked to foreign agencies. I think that's what's happening. The music box and the disc are, um, well, they're unrelated to the case. No, no, no need to spoil the somber atmosphere in the courtroom with some silly bit of music. This disc may very well have motivated the culprit in the case to commit murder. Clearly, there's very every chance that it's fundamentally important to understanding what happened. The prosecution has no objection. But, but no, that piece of it is police property now, you can't. No, we can. Clearly, Scotland Yard has some vested interest here. Well, thank you, um, Lord Van Zeeks. At least he's helping now. But his policy of this prosecutor to leave no avenues unexplored. And you, Inspector, have no jurisdiction here to prevent that from happening. No further delays, please. Play the disc. It sounds... I think that's Morse code. Anybody in the comments know, is this Morse code? I don't know really much about Morse code, but uh, that's what I'm assuming that would be on this disc. Hmm. This is very strange indeed. What on earth? That's not even a song. That's certainly not what I would call music. No. It's just the same note playing over and over again in an irregular sequence. I think it's Morse code. Hmm. What's so funny? Mr. Graydon? This, this really is priceless. 
After all that, the music box is broken. Broken? It, it can't be, can it? Well, obviously. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised. The music box isn't broken. If the officer sent to fetch it, didn't drop it on the way back to the courtroom. The music box isn't broken. Well, with much regret, I feel the court must accept that this music box offers little in the way of clues. No, that it's supposed to be playing the same thing over and over again. The question is, what kind of information is on that disc exactly? What what's the code on it? What is it? What kind of info exactly? Are you ready to move on, counsel? Come on. Yes, alright. It does sound as though it's completely broken, but... Is it? Could this music emulating from this box possibly be a new clue? It could be a clue. I still only have three chances, oh great. I believe that it could be relevant, my lord. Good lord. But, but how can it be? It's an abomination, counsel. More noise. I fail to see how it can have any meaning whatsoever. It does sound strange, I agree. But there's one thing bothering me. While Graydon stand there, uh, chor chortling victoriously, the inspector besides him has a rather telling expression on his face. It's as if Gregson recognizes the sound, as if he's familiar with it somehow. And that's making him appear extremely on edge. If that's the stance of the defense, my Nipponese friend, answer me this. Oh, this should be interesting now. Just what relevance do you propose this woeful char uh, shiming has on this case? I think it's Morse code. It's the defense's belief that the sound em emanating from this disc music box is... Not broken, unusual genre, not supposed to be music. Just because this is a music box, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean the sound we're hearing are music. Look at that. The smile vanished from Graydon's lips as soon as I said it. I'm on the right lines here. I must be. Hehe, <laughs> making deductions based on how people react to what you say. You're acting just like Hurley, Runo. Objection. The sounds we're hearing aren't necessarily music. Well, now that you've told us what they are not... I'm sure the court would like to hear what they are. Do enlighten us, my Nipponese friend. Well, um... Surely you have an idea in mind, because if not... It will be the death of your ill-formed argument. It's Morse code, exactly. The music box is clearly broken. Refusing to accept that fact is pure foolishness. No, he's lying. He's trying to make it seem like it's broken. It's supposed to be playing the same thing over and over again. They've got me. I don't know what the answer is yet. Um, Runo. I've just examined the music box very thoroughly. And I'm fairly certain that it's not broken at all. Really? Really? The way it's been made, it can only produce a single note anyway. Thank you, Iris. Alright, well if the music box isn't broken, it must mean that the sound it's producing have some significance that isn't musical. Ah! Could it be? Is that what these sounds are? Something just struck me, Runo. I feel like recently, in the past few hours even, I've heard another sound very much like this one this music box makes. Is it the telegram sound? Yes, it's a familiar sound. Actually, Iris, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. I'm going to have to press a defense for an answer. If your assertion is that the sound produced by this music box is not in fact music at all, then what the devil is it, Council? All the evidence we've seen so far, all the testimony we've heard, it's all pointing to one single answer now. The prosecution demands that my learned Nipponese friend presents proof now. We'll present proof. Tangible proof of this latest wild speculation. Alright then. 
this could be the best chance I'm going to get to fight back in this trial. And if I'm right, it's going to join all the dots together. This is where the conspiracy finally falls apart. The evidence explains the true nature of the sounds this music box disc are. I'm gonna guess it's the newspaper. Contains an article about government secrets being leaked to foreign agencies. It's this, I think so. Let's see if I'm right. Take that! Today's paper, Council? The headline is Pawnbroker Perishes in Pick Purse Plunder. Hardly support of your cause. I'm right. I'm on the right track. Ah, uh, no, my lord. I was hoping you'd look a little further down the page. Further down. Ministry Mole. Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Yes, this is a very serious matter, being investigated at the highest level, I understand. I have heard that international transmissions along supposedly secure lines are somehow being intercepted, and, I, and leaked to various other countries. And presumably, those transmissions are in the form of wired telegrams. Of course. Juror number five, your input, please. Stop. Oh, my. Me, sir. Whatever is the matter. You told the court before that you worked at the same communication station as Mr. Graydon, did you not? Yes, that's correct. And the particular station where you work? Deals with government communications and newspaper reports. Oh yes, we're not your run-of-the-mill communication station at all. Our work is extremely important. Then tell me, is this not a very familiar sound? Hmm. Look, it is. It's a telegram sound. So it's either Morse code or the telegram. You, you don't mean to say, is it? That's right, madam. It bears more than a passing resemblance to the sound made by your telegraph machine as you tap it. I believe it's called Morse code. I'm right, it's Morse code. But I don't believe it. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to leaking telegrams from government departments, there could be nobody more perfectly placed than a highly skilled communications officer. Are, are you suggesting that music box disc contains stolen government secrets in Morse code? Yep, I was right. Oh my god, I'm so I'm so happy right now. I, I I called it. I was right. I was right on what that disc was. Order, order, please everyone order. But this this is this is high treason council, deserving of capital punishment. Yes. In this time period, um, especially if you leak government secrets, you'd get executed for that. Um uh, so that's that's high treason. You know, it's treason still today, but you know, back then, a lot of countries would execute you for that. Too much new uh, vocabulary. What is this treason, and what is capital punishment? Capital punishment is a death penalty. The sort of words I'd half expect you to know. For our sovereign government's confidential information, hostile nations would sh surely pay almost any price. Yes, and on that night two months ago, that was the, the very negotiation that was taking place inside the omnibus. But in the end, McGilded perished, and the all-important disc lay unclaimed in the pawnbrokery. My word. In which case, whoever stole that information in the first place must surely have been besides himself with worry, because if the disc were to be discovered before it found its way out of the country, it would reveal an act of high treason punishable by death. So the culprit had no choice but to retrieve it. And in order to do that, he would have to gain entry to the pawnbrokery illegally in the middle of the night because the article left behind by Mr. McGilded would incriminate him too much if it got in the wrong hands. Isn't that right, Mr. Graydon? You, you think I've been stealing government secrets. Preposterous, absolutely preposterous. No, you have. So in response to the defense's accusation, you claim complete innocence, do you? Well, of course I do. I've had to stand here in silence while that pretentious foreign lawyer has been prating away. Objection. Then by all means, counter the charges, sir. Oh look, Van Zeeks is backing us up on this. Van Zeeks knows he's guilty. <laughs> I love this. Van Zeeks is helping us now. This is just a, this, this reminds me a lot of the original Ace Attorney when Edgeworth helps you out. The prosecution demands the witness testifies. Response to the accusations brought by the defense. Delighted, I'm sure. 
The witness is reminded that the crime under scrutiny in this trial is the murder of the pawnbroker, Mr. Windebank. That being a most flagitious offense, for which the law of the land sanctions a capital punishment, but the heinous act of high treason is no less a serious crime. I urge you to bear that in mind as you testify, Mr. Graydon. So then, let us proceed. You may... What? You gotta let us have a rabbit and pork here, Governor. We've got things to say. I, I beg your pardon? Who do you think you are? Name's Nash Skulkin. Occupation is pro professional baddie. Name's Ringo Skulkin, but we ain't baddies enough to sell out our mother land. That's right. We're what they call... The Three Skulkin Brothers. Bad timing, fellas. Very bad timing. <laughs> Witness testimony. Graydon's counter. A mere communications officer couldn't possibly steal government, uh, confidential government information. Oh, I beg to differ. Besides, the sounds produced by that music box aren't even Morse code. Yes, they are. It was some low-class brickmaker negotiating with McGilded anyway, was it not? I've no relation to the man. I wondered though, how did Mason get that disc in the first place? That's what still hasn't been um, uh, answered. Look, all we done is break into the gaff the other night, like we it told us to do. If we'd known there was dodgy government secrets involved, we wouldn't have touched it. Um, Mr. and Mr. Skulkin. One Mr. will do, Governor. What's up? Do I take it that you now admit to the crime? That on the night in question, you did indeed gain entry to the premises illegally? And moreover, you did so as par a party of three in collaboration with Mr. Graydon here? We did, Gov. We did. Oh, so they're now incriminating Graydon. Quiet and down now, please. What you say to that, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two ruffians are referring to. You little rudder, getting us mixed up in all this monkey business. You never said nothing about no government secrets. It was supposed to be a straight-up job. And what about the geezer whose shop it was, eh? Poor old bloke didn't have to die, did he? Nice to know who your friends are. Whatever these men say, I deny the accusations. Indeed. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting this little music box to become so significant in the proceedings. However, as it has, I will admit it into the court record as evidence. This strange music box only appears to be able to play a single tone. It was deposit window bags two days before the black overcoat. Graydon's counter. A mere communications officer couldn't possibly steal government confidential uh, information. Holy nope. So is this newspaper headline accurate? Government communications are being intercepted? How could I possibly know? What do you mean by that? Any important government communications are handled by high-level officers, by specialists. General members of staff in the station where I work would never be entrusted with sensitive information. Oh no, stop. Must say something. Stop. Let me guess. Juror number five. <laughs> We regular uh, communication station officers aren't as lowly as you're being led to believe. A team of us are responsible for setting up and testing the telegrams used by the Ministry. And Mr. Graydon is the team leader. That's fascinating. So now she just countered him. His testimony is falling apart. Graydon is highly skilled operator. Stop. Currently in presence of idle. Idle. Stop. Hmm. So you had access to the equipment used for these confidential communications, Mr. Graydon. Well, what of it? The transmissions are always made behind closed doors, so they can't be heard. And in any case, all messages are sent in ciphered. Normal employees couldn't possibly understand them. Oh no, stop. Must say something, stop. Mr. Graydon regularly attends meetings with ministry technicians and the ministry communications team. He assists them in, in, in ensuring that uh, there are no errors in important international communications. And he's received the top prize at the cipher cracking convention five years in a row now. That's fascinating. So this guy's an expert com a communications official. Great is highly skilled operator. Stop. Currently in presence of idle. Stop. Well, your idol would appreciate it. 
you'd keep your mouth shut. She should really pick her idols more carefully. I, I tell you, this lawyer's accusations are completely unfounded. Besides, the sounds produced by the music box aren't even Morse code. Nope, they are. They're not? To anyone with a brain, that would be blatantly apparent on listening to the music box for even a few seconds. Of course, of course. Surely it can't be that my learned friend is unfamiliar with Morse code. Ouch. He looks genuinely shocked at my ignorance. Haha. <laughs> I would be more than happy to demonstrate the basics for you, sir. A, a lesson here in court. Morse code is a continuous series of two distant tones. I know that, though, but I don't know exactly how they translate messages. Tones, you say? Yes, a short dot and a long dash. By combining those in different ways, you construct letters. So, like, anybody that knows anything about Morse code, if you're watching this video, like, let me know in the comments, is this, a is this an accurate d d description of what's going on here, of Morse code? Um, and would, would somebody actually be able, in this time period, to steal government secrets like that? On, on, and put it on a disc in Morse code, I don't know. Um, but, you know, judging by the fact that the disc all has bumps on it and can be played like that, like with, you know, the dots and the dashes, um, like, you know, the little um, uh, sounds, I'm guessing it can, because um, that's kind of what Morse code sounds like. Um, I see. For example, this is A, and this is B. But when you listen to the sound produced by this music box, you only hear one tone, don't you? But well, it sounds so similar. The rhyme of it is the same in everything. But there's no discernible uh, meaning to this apparently random sequence of sounds. So your assertion is fundamentally flawed. This is not Morse code. Really, you shouldn't be so surprised. What did I tell you? That music box is nothing but a worthless piece of scrap. Perhaps you might consider studying your subject matter before casting aspersions in the future. Ugh, stop. Nothing to say but stop. Oh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Iris. I mean, if the government secrets were somehow being leaked using the music box, so many other things would slot into place so nicely. Could there still be something I haven't considered? Would it really be impossible to use this music box somehow to play back Morse code? Hmm. Let's give it a try. There's still every possibility this music box was instrumental in the leaking of government secrets. That's the belief of the defense, at least. Objection. Does it please you in some way, my Nippity's friend, uh, to repeat the same line of argument ad infinitum? It's already been established that to be Morse code, two tones are required, dots and dashes. Yes, I'm well aware of that. Then what? Maybe you flip the disc over on the other side? Well, it would appear the defense has a hypothesis to put forward. You had better present your idea at once, counsel. How do you propose that this music box, which appears to produce only a single tone, could have been used to cipher secret messages in the Morse code? Hmm. Oh, what is it, Runo? I've, I've just noticed something about this music box. It looks like the bottom of it opens up as well. Ah, you're right. Well, come on then, what are you waiting for? Let's open it. Alright then, here goes. Look at that, there's another movement on the underside. So, I guess I was right? Maybe I was 50% right? You flip it over, but you don't flip the disc over. You play it on the other side, too. You can set another disc to play back on this side. So there's a second disc involved. Yes, I think so. And it looks like the two movements are linked together. They're linked. So if you had two discs, they would both play back at the same time. Right here. Got it. This is it. Good gracious. What am I looking at here? Another movement on the other side of the music box? What? It appears, my lord, that the two movements are linked together. In other words, you can put two discs in this music box. 
and the sounds of both will play back at the same time. Good heavens. As the chorus heard, Morse code comprises of two tones, a short dot and a long dash. With a second disc in place, this music box will be used to generate Morse code and convey a message. This is beyond a joke. And uh, you guys are probably wondering, what country is he leaking this government information to? What government? He's probably leaking this information to the German Empire. Because in this time period before World War I, um, Great Britain and um, Germany actually had a Cold War, and they were both building up weapons and constantly spying on each other. So he's probably sending the information over to the German Empire. Um, that's probably the country that he's um, uh, reporting to. I'm sorry? This poor excuse for a lawyer has absolutely no evidence to support his claims. Well, if we get the second disc, it'll prove it. Though, of course, if my learned friend were able to present the court with the second disc, that would be another matter. Well? I, I can't at the moment. Hmm. And may I remind the court that as the witness has pointed out, he was not the one in the omnibus with McGilded two months ago striking a deal over the disc or discs. Indeed. That was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. Exactly. I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. Though it has holes, I must admit the argument presented by the defense has much promise. I believe the cross-examination should continue. The link between Graydon and the victim of the omnibus case must be there somewhere. But I haven't found it yet. Oh dear. It looks like you need to give your argument more strength, Bruno. You will re reiterate your testimony if you please, Mr. Graydon. If I must, though, I maintain exactly what I did at the start of this pointless cross-examination. It was some... okay. Did the previous statement change? It was some low-class brickmaker negotiating with McGillan anyway, was it not? I have no relation to the man. Let me just get a drink one moment, guys. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I just wanted to get something to drink, because, um, some orange juice, because when you, um, uh, when you're playing this game a lot and you're reading through a lot of stuff, you want to get, a, um, something to drink. Okay, get my controller here. So, two months ago in the Omnibus, McGilded killed the brickmaker and stole the disc. Mr. Mason was a single man with almost nothing to his name. It seems he lived in an artist, um, artisan quarter some years ago, but people there remember little about him. That doesn't make much sense, though, does it? How would a humble brickmaker come to acquire secret government information? Unless he was, um, uh, you know, the only thing I can think of is he was renovating some old government building or something like that. That's the only thing that I could think of. How indeed. There must have been somebody else involved behind the scenes in all of this. Somebody who acquired a disc and gave it to Mr. Mason. In order to take it to the meeting with McGilded and negotiate a deal. Dear me. You may have it in for me, sir, but I assure you, I have far more class than that. Well, we're gonna take you down in a moment. An old brick maker from an artist artisan quarter and this well-to-do communications officer. If only I could find some evidence to link the two of them together. If you have nothing more to, to add on note, let us return the witness testimony. There has to be some way to link them. Look at all we done is break into the gaff the other night like what he told us to do. Hold it. Like Mr. Graydon told you to do, you mean? That's it, yeah. Who else, eh? Silly me thought he was popping over from uh, Natter after all them years, but the rather add a dodgy job for us. Hey, Ash? Look, he's not even giving them eye contact right now. Let me stop you there, Mr. Skulkin. After all them years, you say. Do you mean to tell me that Mr. Graydon is an acquaintance of yours? We're the sociable kind of baddies, you know. 
Sure, let's say Graydon's an old, sh uh, China. And what is, uh, what is he or he, what is he thinking? Excuse me. Is something wrong, Mr. Skulkin? Eh? No, the other Mr. Skulkin. What? Who? Me? When your brother was testifying just now, he said something that seemed to cause you to react. Oh, I was just remembering the old days, that's all. We used to have a right old laugh together way back when. Together. With Mr. Graydon, you mean? Yeah, with Ash, I mean. Yeah, look at I'm now is fancy whistle and flute, and you wouldn't add him and eat it. But when he was younger, he was from the poor part of town, just like us. Is that so? But he was always a leery one. He had the brains, he had the savvy. Always coming up with smart ideas like what would never have gone through our heads. Gore blimey, ain't that the truth? Remember Mil Milverton and Skulky Skulkin's milk run? That was a corker, eh? Save it until after the trial. Your re reminiscing has no place in this courtroom. And neither does your fruit. <laughs> oh my god, neither does your fruit. Well, I don't think your wine has any place in this court. I don't think a lot of things have place in this court. The, the knives that jurors have brought in, the telegrams, the alcohol that Van, Van Zeeks drinks, like, um, there's just so many ridiculous... The tea? Like, so many ridiculous things that people bring into court. <laughs> Why, the geezer asked us a question, didn't he? And we was answering. Yeah, we ain't done nothing wrong. Nevertheless, the court is not prepared to accompany you on your trip down memory lane. Counsel, can we turn our attention back to the testimony, please? I don't know. Could that sentimental story be relevant somehow? Add it to the testimony. My lord. Yes, counsel. The brother's last sentimental statement could hold vital information relating to this case. Very well, counsel. I will permit the brothers to supplement their testimony with that detail. Briefly, I hasten to add. Say no more, a skulkin's never a skulkin. Okay. Let's press this statement. If we known there was dodgy government secrets involved, we wouldn't have touched it. So did you know nothing about this music box? We didn't know nothing. We still don't know nothing, and we ain't uh, planning on knowing nothing about it neither. But two nights ago, you didn't need break in the Windebank's pawn brokery, didn't you? In your original testimony, you said the door of the shop was ajar, and that it was like some kind of sign begging you to go in. But the truth is, you were planning to break into Windebanks all along, weren't you? We were, Gov, we were. You're right there. Because that's what he told us to do. It was his plan. And why was it Mr. Graydon's plan to break into Windebanks that night? Did you not ask the reason? Well, um... Um... He said the place was full of stuff worth nicking. That's what he told us beforehand anyway. Turned out it was a load of cobblers, didn't it? I weren't best pleased, I can tell you. In any case, if they kn know the real reason, it doesn't sound like they're going to give it away. Milverton and Skulkin, uh, Milk Run. Gore, them, uh, them were the days. Let's press this. I'm sure I'm going to regret asking, but... What exactly was that, some kind of business? Just a little scheme we had going back when we was youngsters. A bit of fun, really. Delivering fresh milk to the locals, that's what it was all about. That sounds alarmingly legitimate. There must be a catch. I suppose since we're here, I should ask them to elaborate, but on what? Um... Hmm... The business model? So, how did your little business work exactly? Well, every morning down our way, the milkman would come with his car to deliver milk, see? If you stuck your empties out your front door, he would leave you, uh, uh, them full again, right? So, we swooped in on the action, got people to sign up with us. We promised to deliver milk for half, uh, 
half the price of the other geezers doing it. People couldn't wait to sign on the dotted line. We were raking it in, we were. So, did you live on a dairy farm or something? Gordon Bennett, are you off your rocker? We had nothing. We were top poor to have a farm. Right. Nah, what uh, we had going was a simple one, you had the idea. We just switch them over, see? Our customers empties with the full ones from anyone who wasn't on our books. A doddle, right? I think you meant to say a diddle, and that's a crime. It was just an alarmist bit of fun, that's it. Milking the general public in such a fashion is most certainly not armless, as you put it. Well, it was. I'm what came up with the idea, Ash is the evil genius. You mean Mr. Graydon? Yeah, Ash always had his head in a book when we was growing up. Said he was gonna get himself an edu... edumation and get out of the slum we lived in. He means education. Core, we all ragged I'm about that, didn't we? Told him he was soft in the head uh, to e even think of, think it. But look at him now. He's only uh, gone and become a Blinken com communication officer, ain't he? A communications officer, Mr. Skulkin. Hmm. Sholmes and Wilson's milk run. No, Iris, don't even think about it. <laughs> all of a sudden, we seem to be up to our necks in a serious matter of national security. Although, all this talk about interception of sec secret government messages is still conjecture at this stage. It would explain a number of things, though, wouldn't it? The negotiation Ginny overheard on the Omnibus two months ago and the break-in at Windebanks. But the trouble is, it wasn't Mr. Graydon in the Omnibus with Mr. McGilded. No, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker, who was so horribly murdered. Hmm. If only there was some link between the two men somehow. I know, but Mr. Graydon's testimony seems to be as watertight as ever. I wonder if the key to uh, us making headway with the cross-examination here could be those two brothers. Where did they even get that fruit from? Let's uh, go back to them again. And let's ask them about the name of the... Of the... Hold it! Let's let the business name. So this business was just a bit of fun, you say? And it was just yourselves and Mr. Graydon involved? Yeah, that's it. Milverton and Skulkin's milk run, was it? Yeah, that's it. And where did... the Milverton part come from? Oh, right. I thought a clever clogs like you would have worked that one out. That is... Enough of this. Oh, he doesn't want them to say it. How much longer are we expected to listen to this drivel? Objection. I don't... Let me guess. You don't accept anything these two witnesses are saying. Tell me, why is it that it was only at the mention of the name Milverton that you decided to interject? Because I, well... It weren't the happiest of ohms that one came from. Yeah, his old man was struggling for money so much, his wife talked him talked out on I'm. She took the name Graydon then, see? But Ash will always be Milverton to us. Milverton. So that used to be your surname, did it? Of course not. That is all bunkum. I've been a Graydon since I was born. Do you really think you can rely on the testimony of these two thieves, hmm? You're a communications officer, officer attached to the civil service. As such, your personal details will have been thoroughly checked at the time of your appointment. It would be a very simple matter indeed to subpoena those records, Mr. Graydon. Hmm. <laughs> Look, Van Zeeks is helping us. Will appear that Mr. and Mr. Skulkin's testimony has been reliable for once. <laughs> for once. I like how the judges says that for once. Because their testimony has been so nonsense from the start, but now it's finally reliable. You were born Ashley Milverton, then. Is that correct? Very well, yes. So Ashley Graydon was once Ashley Milverton. That information could change things. 
and could turn out to be extremely important. He's a child of friend of the Skulkins. Okay. All of a sudden, we... Okay. Hang on, let's, uh, let's, let's look at the link between the, um... Let's look at the, um... Okay, hang on. Am I able to see Mason's name? Um... Hang on, how do I... Hmm... How would I go to the people? I don't have an option to uh, go to the people. We're about to bring we're about to bring down this guy's testimony. He clearly did it. We're going to end this conspiracy once and for all. Let's press this. Oh, can we see seen this already? We have evidence right now, um... Hmm, I'm just looking if there's something my camera is blocking. How do I get to the people, um... Oh, hang on, McGilded case notes, wait. Oh, here we got it. McGilded case notes. Look at this. Name. Mason Milverton. The guy's related to him. That's... He's he's somehow related to him. The brickmaker could be his dad. So he grew up in a... He grew up in a poor neighborhood. The brick... He gave... He gave the disc to his dad. And his dad went to go meet with, um, uh... With McGilded, and McGilded killed him. Okay, here we go. Present this. Objection. We got it now. It's over. Mr. Ashley Milverton. Tell me, why did you try to hide your former uh, name from the court? Because I haven't gone by that name for years. It means nothing to me. No, I don't think that's the real explanation at all. The truth is, you had a reason to hide that name. Explain yourself, please, counsel. I have here notes from the omnibus case, my lord. And as we know, the victim, the man who we now understand to have been negotiating with McGilded. Yes, Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. That's right, only Mason wasn't his surname at all. It was his given name. His full name, it was Mason Milverton. Milverton. Milverton, do you mean to say Saints Alive? Mr. Ashley Milverton. Is it not the case that the brickmaker, Mr. Mason Milverton, was your father? Ugh, I, I don't... As I believe I mentioned earlier, your fam family history will have been thoroughly checked when you join the civil service. And it really would take no time at all for the court to subpoena those records. The truth is, you have been illegally acquiring highly confidential government information and selling it to onto McGilded in collaboration with your father. The new facts and evidence unveiled by the cross-examination as witness all come together to reveal the truth. That the truth, you say? 
that you collaborated with your father, Mr. Mason Milverton, in illegal dealings with Magnus McGilded. By dint of this music box, you mean, Council? Yes, stealing information being sent in secret government communications and selling it on to McGilded. Mr. Gray Graydon concocted this elaborate scheme um, using uh, two music box discs to encode the information as presumably a safety measure against the information falling into the wrong hands. And a very effective one. I shouldn't have given that scheme any credence whatsoever. But the deal with McGilded went sour, and the brickmaker met his end. Yes, but before he was arrested, McGilded managed to temporarily dispose of the stolen disc at the pawnbroker. Then, having learned of the situation, you appeared at Windabanks two days ago, in an attempt to recover the two articles McGilded had placed in pawn there. But that attempt failed. One of the discs was seized by the police, and the other you never found. So that same night, you enlisted the help of the Skulkin brothers and broke into the pawnbrokery. This time, determined to recover the second disc. Are you suggesting that the second disc was inside the music box? Eh? We, we never knew nothing about that. On the night that Mr. Windebank was killed. So I was right, it was something that was taken from the music box, it was the disc. The intruder upon broker touched one item, and one item alone, the music box. As rather in ingeniously demonstrated using the two prints from the security camera, indeed. So the question that naturally begs answering is this. Why was uh, only that one article disturbed? The answer is obvious, because it contained a second disc, which the intruder was desperate to retrieve. Since, if it were to fall into the hands of the police, it will be proof of high treason. Well, Mr. Graydon? Do you deny that all of this actually began on that fateful night two months ago? I, I... I refuse to accept any of this nonsense. This guy's not budging. But Van Zeeks knows. I can just see it. Just look at Van Zeeks, Van Zeeks' face. He knows this guy's guilty. Look at the judge. the judge. The judge isn't buying his nonsense either. Sir. There appears to be blood seeping through the sleeve of your jacket. Oh, look. What? He opened up his wound. Ha! So he got so pissed off, he opened up his wound. Two nights ago, we know that three shots were fired at the scene of the crime in Windebank's pawnbrokery. One took the life of the pawnbroker himself. One struck the pouch around Mr. Shone's waist, and the third hit him. And the final bullet... ...struck the calendar on the wall of the shop, having first pierced the arm of one of the intruders. Mr. Graydon, that wound on your arm that you seem to be trying to hide. It's a bullet wound, isn't it? He's got you now, me old China. Time to call it quits and croak, I reckon. Tisk. Don't acknowledge my presence there under any circumstances whatsoever. Those were my terms, remember? And I paid you handsomely to comply. Clearly I was a fool to think I could trust some common backslum thieves. He's admitting to it now. Fine. I admit it. I was there in Windebanks that night. I paid the pair ten um, to accompany me. And as you've noticed, I sustained an injury in the course of my adventures. But that is all. I admit to nothing more. Sealing government secrets? Negotiating with Mr. McGilded? As God is my witness, I'm sure I recall nothing of the sort. Well, I don't think you want God your witness because God would know exactly um, uh, what you've done. He's not going to go down without a fight. Not until I can show hard evidence, I suppose. Nevertheless, the defense has now established a crucial fact. Which is? Well, we know that one bullet was fired from each of the two firearms we have in evidence. The bullet from the Skulkin Brothers gun hit the pouch around Mr. Sholmes' waist. And the bullet from Mr. Windebank's gun. Clearly must have been the one that caught Mr. Graydon on the arm. Indeed it must. 
we can rule out the possibility that the man shot himself. And that leads us to only one conclusion. Mr. Windebank was shot by a third gun. Which can only have been fired by the third intruder. Goodness. That's right, Mr. Graydon. The only person who could possibly have shot Mr. Windebank that night is you. Hold it. Oh, what's so funny? You little upstart. You made a grave mistake when you summoned me here. What? What's that supposed to mean? Yes, as you rightly say, I was there at the pawnbrokers. I did my best to hide the fact, naturally. I had no intention of running the distinguished uh, career I'd built for myself at the communication station. But did the thought never cross your mind? Did you never consider it a possibility? What? What do you mean? What thought? What possibility? The possibility that if I was there at the scene, I may have witnessed a crucial moment. You see... This makes me a key witness in this case. My hand's firmly around the neck of your client. No. No, no, no. No, it doesn't. Um, uh, the guy... And he, he's... A, the, the guy's already lied in his testimony numerous times. He lied about his... He lied about his name. He lied about the music box. He lied about not being at the shop. He lied about being shot. So there's like so many things that he this guy's lied about. And yet th this guy's not a crucial witness. This guy's not even a witness at all. This guy's te this is this is very unrealistic right now because this guy's testimony would not fly at all. This is just the amount of lies that this guy made. This is nonsense. No. Don't accept his testimony, judge. Don't accept it. It's it's all nonsense. I saw it all. I saw the very moment that pickpocket girl pointed the gun at that poor defenseless pawn worker. With what gun? With what gun exactly? Tell me, what gun? Order, order, order. Well, it would seem we are finally entering the last act of this theoretical trial. Theoretical trial. Mr. Graydon. Yes? I trust you are fully aware of the implications here. It is shown that your if it is shown that your claim is false, you will have incriminated yourself as the killer. Oh, I understand fully. Van Zeeks knows. Van Zeeks knows he did it. Then I must ask you to give your formal testimony once more. See, this is nonsense. The, the judge j the judge is being stupid right now because this this any any judge would throw this right out He'd be like no you're not allowed to testify on this because this is this is nonsense the, the amount of lies the guy did the, the fact that the guy admitted to being at the shop um uh you know lying about all this stuff you know no you will explain to the court precisely what you saw at the moment the defendant allegedly shot the victim i think van zeke's gonna just uh want wants us actually to bring this guy down nothing would give me greater pleasure well, like, nothing's gonna give me greater pressure bringing this guy down. The moment of the shooting. While these ruffians were jostling with the broker, I was still near the entrance to the shop. No. When Windebank threw Nash over the counter, I felt a sharp pain in my arm. I pursued the man, but he shut himself in the storeroom. I could see him through the peephole in the door, though. The accused, in a black coat, shot the man in the back as he was trying to flee to safety. I saw the blood splatter all over that wretched girl. Then she tossed the gun out of the peephole, so I picked it up and made my escape. Why would she toss the gun out of the peephole? That, 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 and she, he said Gina had blood on her, but I don't remember any blood being on Gina. You claim, sir, under oath. I have clearly seen the defendant pulling the, the, the trigger. Order, order, order. It wasn't my intention to testify in this way. But neither is it my intention to be found guilty of a murder I didn't commit. So you see, my hand has been forced. I tell the truth now as an act of self-preservation. The truth. Until now, the prosecution was completely unaware of these details. Yes. Well, um, sorry about that. 
Having shot me in the arm, the pawnbroker was then shot in the back by the accused. And as I said, she was sh showered in his blood. You say the blood splattered over the accused's coat. Are you sure on that point? Oh yes, quite sure. All over the black overcoat the pickpocket girl was wearing at the time. Really? If her coat could somehow be shown to harbor vestiges of blood, that will be conclusive evidence here. No, oh, Van Zeek still drinking, I see. Such an investigation is entirely possible, my lord. What? Only very recently, a German scientist developed a technique to identify a human blood. So here's to true science, not some amateurish detective's dubious foray in the world of chemistry. There's nothing dubious about Hurley's work, his ideas are all sound. Ideas are no use to us here. In science, as in law, theories must be proven before they stand. In Germany, the technique has already been employed in the courtroom as the basis of evidence. Scotland Yard is a small quantity of the chemical regent used, with your lordship's permission. We could shatter all vestiges of doubt within minutes. Hmm. This doesn't look good, Bruno. Why not? Well, we know, don't we, that there's blood all over the front of Ginny's coat, but that blood was, um, Mason's blood. If they test it with their chemicals... Oh, help. You're right. I was forgetting what happened yesterday. Don't move, Ginny. I'm going to shoot. Gina's coat has blood all over, but that's not- that's not the blood of the- of- of... That's not the blood of Mr. Windebank, it's the blood of Mason. That's Mr. Mason's blood from when he was stabbed by McGillit, who was wearing the coat at the time. My lord, the defense objects to the test proposed by the prosecution. Overruled. Lord Van Zeeks, make it so at once. With pleasure, my lord. And while we await the results, the defense may proceed with the cross-examination. Ex Once they find that blood in the overcoat, Gina will be... Counsel! Yes, my lord. Your cross-examination. Of course, my lord. And this cross-examination doesn't go well. If I don't manage to uncover some decisive evidence or a really compelling clue now, I have a very bad feeling about the outcome of this trial. The moment of the shooting. While these ruffians were jo jostling with the broker, I was still near the entrance to the shop. Mr. Windebank emerged from the storeroom, I believe. Ringo and Nash were s scouring the counter when he suddenly appeared and flew at them. He already had the revolver in his hand. Fortunately, I wasn't too close. I've never been so scared in all me life. Yeah. We're just irregular, mild-mannered burglars, that's all. We don't like violence. Says the pair who carry a gun. What do you mean when you say you were near the entrance to the shop? I was in the doorway, running my eyes over the shelves of forfeited items. But remember that his picture could have been taken then. Looking for the music box, of course. The broker went for Nash in the first place. Then Ringo joined in, making it two against one, so I assumed they could handle the situation. But I was wrong. I was trying to help me, little bruv, but the old geezer chucked me over the bloomin' uh, counter. So I pulled me gun on the old fella, and that uh, soon made him scarper. The pair of you settling upon the poor defenseless pawnbroker together. Shame on you. Sorry, gov. When Windebank threw Nash over the counter, I felt a sharp pain in my arm. You mean, that's the moment you were shot? Yes, though I didn't immediately realize what had happened, of course. Things crashed to the floor from the counter as the three men were brawling. It was at exactly that moment that it happened, so I didn't hear the gunshot. And the bullet went on to strike the calendar in the wall behind you. So it, it would appear. When I looked at my arm, I saw it was bleeding badly, so I wrapped my handkerchief around it. Seeing as I couldn't explain what had happened to a doctor, I had no choice but to wait for it to heal. I didn't imagine it would still be bleeding two days later. 
Did Mr. Winterbank intend to shoot you, do you think? Well, now, I don't imagine he even noticed I was there, to be honest. Perhaps the gun went off accidentally. Anyway, it didn't quite strike home. When I pulled me gun on him, I'm he tried to shove me out the way. And there's E. Scarpered through the door out back. At which point, what did you do? I pursued the man, but he shut himself in the storeroom. I could see him through the peephole in the door, though. You mean, you chased after him? I don't re recall the reason why, but I ran after him, after him to the back of the shop. And what about this peephole in the door you mentioned? Well, unsurprisingly, the storeroom door is a solid job, made of stout wood. But there's a small opening in it, about about head weight that less, lets you see what's that in there from the outside. But now the question is, can somebody from the inside open that, that, um, that storeroom um, door? Actually, I should know that, shouldn't I? I looked through it myself that night. And what about you burgling brothers? Did you see what went on through this peephole as well? No, not not likely, Gov. Didn't see nothing of the sort, Gov. I doubt these two buffoons were even aware of the peephole's existence. So the Skulkin brothers were there. They didn't uh, see the killing of Mr. Windebank take place. Hmm. Inside the storm, I could see the broker um, and that young girl standing there. The defendant. Yes. Through neither of them noticed um, uh, that I was looking. The girl raised her um, uh, her gun and pointed straight at the man. And then, what did you see next? The accused in a bl uh, black coat shot the man in the back as he was trying to flee to safety. But where would he flee exactly? Yes, when the crime was discovered, the defendant was found with a gun in her hand. But that was Mr. Windebank's gun, from which only a single bullet had been fired. And as we've already established, Mr. Graydon, that bullet was fired at you. Ah, but no. It wasn't the broker's gun that the pickpocket girl had when I saw her. Yes, the bullet from Windebank's gun was grazed my arm, and yes, the Skulkin's gun grounded the detective. But this was another gun entirely, a third gun. The broker's gun was not the murder weapon, so clearly there had to be a third firearm involved. In other words, the accused must have had her own gun with her at the time. But no other gun was found at the scene! He's laughing. Calm yourself, counsel. Sorry? You must consider the events in order. At first, I saw the broker and the girl glaring at each other, but then all of a sudden, the broker turned to run. And it was that moment that the little gutter rat shot him in the back. A chilling image, I must say. I saw the blood spatter all over the wretched girl. All, all over her. Yes, through the peephole I saw it clearly. Of course, the stains are invisible now, what with the copings to dark color. But I assure you, that garment uh, is uh, sullied with the victim's blood. Well, it is sullied with blood, that's for sure, but it's not the victim's blood. But it's not Mr. Windebank's blood, is it? No, that's right. It's Mr. Mason Milberton's blood from when McGilded stabbed him two months ago. It's so annoying. If they'd only accept Hurley's chemical analysis, we could prove that. But they won't, so unfortunately we can't use this evidence to support our cause. Bother. Then she tossed the gun out of the peephole, so I picked it up and made my escape. That makes no sense! Why would she toss the gun at the peephole? Did I hear you correctly? She threw the gun in the room. Well, the thing is, if he took the gun, he could just tell the police where's the gun then. That, that's uh, what we can ask him. That's right. After the broker fell to the floor, she started wa uh, walking over. Over where, exactly? In the direction of the storeroom door, to where I was watching. Of course, I quickly retreated. And then, the girl dropped the gun through the peephole onto the floor on my side of the door. 
but why on earth would she do such a thing? I couldn't tell you. Pe uh, perhaps she was hoping to distance herself from the murder weapon. Without thinking, I went and picked it up. I suppose I was worried about just leaving it there, in case any more tragedies took place. Oh yeah, you, you so, so care about tragedies. So it was you, in fact, who took the third gun from the scene of the crime. Yes, it was yours truly, so Banzeeks is probably gonna ask him then where's the gun. Hmm. I left a clear up to my lackeys and left. Clear up. We made a bit of mess around the counter, so Mr. Uh, Whistle and Flute here told us to tidy up. He thinks our blooming, uh, he thinks he's our blooming mom sometimes. Well, I was uh, uh, paying you enough, by God. Ah. Uh. Tell me, Mr. Graydon, when you left the pawnbrokery that night, was it by any chance with the second disc in your jacket pocket? You're like a bull at a gate. Uh, what's going on right here? Excuse me. Gentlemen. Ha, 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 ha. Something wrong, Sunshine? That should be my line. You do realize you were just violently shaking Mr. Skulkin. Blimey, this D's a bit of an ooligan, ain't he? What was going on just now? You saw... You saw him. He grabbed me whistle. Why the blazes, he said, Didn't you mention the third gun when we got you down at the station? And why didn't you? Cuz, we didn't know nothing about it. Or that flaming uh, peephole in the door. Um, sorry about that. I can be prone to losing my rags sometimes. Not hurt, are you? Gore blimey. See the way he's looking at me. I'm telling you, this D gives me the willies. That was strange. The inspector doesn't normally get quite as worked up as that. He wouldn't normally grab someone. No, that wasn't like Gregzy at all. He's normally all sweetness and light, no matter what I say to him. Yes, well, I think you might be a special case, Iris. Well, anyway, that was definitely out of character. My lord. Requ requesting your lordship's permission to interrupt the cross-examination. Explain yourself, officer. I have the results of the test that was ordered earlier today, my lord. Ah, the blood. On the accused overcoat. Thank you, officer. Very well. The cross-examination is hereby temporarily suspended. I presume you have no objection, counsel. Um, no, my lord. Now, this test is going to go really bad, because it's going to show there's blood in the coat, but it's not, it's not the victim's coat. Well, there you have it. The report, please, inspector. Yes, sir. Traces of human blood were found on the overcoat of the defendant, Miss uh, Gina Lestrade. From the extent of the stains, it would appear that they were the result of spathering following a gunshot wound. End of report. Goodness me. Oh no. See? What did I tell you? No. The blood on that coat is not Mr. Windebanks. What on earth makes you say that, Counsel? The coat originally belonged to Magnus McGilded. Just before his coat was deposited at Windebanks, McGilded had fatally stabbed Mr. Mason Milverton. So the blood on that overcoat is the blood of the brickmaker from the Omnibus case. Well, but the dead cannot speak. Isn't that right, my Nipponese friend? Sorry? Two months ago, in this very courtroom, did you not argue favor fervently for McGillard's innocence? And yet now that the man is dead, you brand him as a murderer. Your conduct shatters any shred of respect you may have earned uh, yourself in this country. Ah, but but that was... I call it a bali, bat, bali disgrace treachery what it is. Hmm, how to determine whether the blood on that coat is two months old or not. Even a stereoscope couldn't help answer that problem pop out. It can't be done. Well, it, it can actually. Um, you don't even need really scientific technology for this. 
um, uh, blood that's old will turn black. So blood that's like, you know, blood that's fresh, you, when you see like in movies and games, when you know characters, you know, when enemies bleed, you see that like bright red blood. But that bright red blood, you only see that right when the person gets shot or hit or stabbed, whatever causes bleeding. And so after that, blood actually turns a blackish color over time. So there is actually a way to tell that the blood's really old. But, but, we use Mr. Shom's specially formulated chemicals. Mr. Shom's detective, not a chemist. Would you put such faith in a chemical formula devised by me, for example, when I'm a communications officer? I held out P Piroski to starving boy, and he ran away crying. What does that have to do with the case? Herlock Sholmes is barely more than a uh, figment of the public's imagination. His name carries no weight in this courtroom, no weight at all. How could you say that? Victory is sweet indeed. No, this is not over yet. This proves that my testimony is the whole truth from start to finish. How do you arrive at such a conclusion, sir? As the witness said, the accused coat was spattered with the blood of the victim. The only way Mr. Graydon could possibly have known that fact is as is if he saw it happen. In other words, his testimony is solid, and the conclusion is singular. No, because he would know because that's the coat that Magnus McGilded was wearing when he stabbed his father, so he would know that. It was the accused who shot the victim in this case. That is the whole truth. No, it's not. My lord. Been a long battle, this one. But this old war horse has something to say now, if you please. Mr. Foreman? As of this moment, sir, the squadron has reached its final decision. Ready, men? All for one now. Sir. Guilty. Oh, no. Guilty. 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 Oh, no. It can't end like this. Well, it would appear that ladies and gentlemen of the jury have reached a unanimous verdict. The defense has consistently failed to unpack this witness's testimony. Here's to any attempt you may make at unpicking the juror's decision being equally successful. Ugh. I don't believe it. After I've come so far, how is it all unraveling on me so fast? How very distressing to be held in such lowest esteem. Is that Herlock Sholmes? Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Na uh, uh, Mr. Naruto? Who? Bailiff? Officer, is that Mr. Herlock Sholmes? You've delivered the report now. That will be all. Thank you. It occurs to me with some regularity, Mr. Naruto, that scientific truths are determined not by science but by uh, none other than the human mind. I, I know that voice. Am I going mad? Uh. Oh my god, it's Herlock Sholmes. Mr. Sholmes. What? What is the meaning of this? Order, order, order. What business do you have here? Detective, the last I heard you were rec recuperating in the hospital. As well as I would be, had I not been set upon an errand. What errand? Hurley, it's really you. You're awake at last. Yes, good day, Iris. I appear to be rather late to rise. My apologies. Now, my lord, if you will humor me. In what manner, sir? I have something of great importance I wish to give to the young lawyer over there. I need no more than five minutes. Would you be so kind as to spare us the time? Hmm. What say you to this, Lord Van Zeeks? This trial has taken many hours the course time, having spent so long already. Exactly, having spent so long already, we don't want to go wasting any more precious time. You're an idiot, Gregson. We, we, we're about to get to the truth. As I was saying, having spent so long already, it would seem uh, churlish to deny the defense a mere five minutes. Very well then, counsel. 
You have five minutes. My dear fellow, I apologize for my tardy arrival. Mr. Sholmes, are you alright now? Alright, I'm all wrong. Sorry? I've only just managed to summon the strength to stand, man. I asked the judge for five minutes. But I fear even that may prove too much for me. Pray forgive me uh, should I pass out. Um, let's make this discussion as short as possible. Hurley, this place is full of idiots. <laughs> I agree. It is full of idiots. None of them can see how won uh, wonderful your chemical blood analysis is. Ah, well. That uh, con concoction of mine was really just a bit of sport to assist me in my investigations. I never took the trouble to refine it for appraisal by the scientific community and oversight on my part. Right. Modesty. Surely not. But enough of that. I'm here to give you this. My dear fellow, what is this? What's that? A lavender for a shaky wrapping? A leaving present from Miss Suzato. From Miss Suzato? If possible, matters were to be set uh, settled without me giving you this. Those were her instructions when she asked me to do her this favor. So that's what she, uh, I, I don't understand. Miss Suzato foresaw today's events, I believe. She knew that the culprit would attempt to escape justice by means both devious and underhand. And that you, Mr. Naruto, fighting fairly as you are, won't to do, would find yourself in a considerable peril. At that very moment of crisis, you were to be given this small parcel. Those were the dear lady's instructions. A leaving present for Miss Suzato's son. Whatever could it be? What is this? Oh, wait, is that the is that the 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 gun that makes doggy doors? It's the machine I made. Ah. But how is this relevant right now? It will be the cat door, I should say, not doggy doors. Um. Look, I used this. It's my latest invention. What? What is that? I call it the cat flap o mat. It can make a cat flap for a little furry friend like Waggy in seconds. But how is this relevant right now? What's Susie up to? Miss Suzato muttered the following words before she left. I'm a failure. I don't deserve to be a judicial assistant. What? Didn't she say something like that? She did. You really are the best judicial assistant in the world. Well, that's extremely flattering. But I'm sorry to say... ...that I've been a complete failure. Whatever did she mean by that, Mr. Sholmes? That night, when you left Windabanks and pursued the thieves... Miss Suzato made use of the contraption for a certain purpose. That is your answer, dear fellow. Not... not at all cryptic, then. Suzato's son used this cat flap on mat that night, but why? Your five minutes is over. We're out of time already? I'm grateful to you for affording us that brief recess, Mr. Reaper. I need no thanks, detective. After all, the d die is cast. Is it really? The jurors are unanimous in their leanings. No doubt my learned friend will consider a summation examination. But any attempt to alter the verdict now would be utterly futile. I wonder... Mr. Naruto. Yes. The rest is down to you, dear fellow. What is your plan? The rest is down to me. I need to be careful here. If I make a wrong move, the trial will end badly. My lord, the defense requests...
Whoa, those vicious teeth look like they could rip through almost anything. They're good, aren't they? They're made of a special alloy I developed just for this job. The cutter rotates ten times per second so it could get through any kind of door in no time at all. And what are the two parts at the top there? Ah, those are for attaching hinges to the se uh, section of the door that gets cut out. Right, of course. Nothing can match this machine for power. It can make mincemeat of even the toughest of doors. It sounds so charming and friendly when you say what it's for, but... It feels like the reality of the cat Flapplemat is that it's a grim weapon of door destruction. Wakahai is so adorable, there's nothing I wouldn't do for him, even developing deadly weapons. Hmm... How is this relevant to the case? It has something to do with that door at the pawn shop. Wait a second. Wait. Oh my god. I think I've got it. This door. That's the that's the answer right there. That's the answer. Look. It's it's the it's the door. I, I know what happened now. I got it, because I was thinking, how could this possibly be relevant? It's It changes everything. I, a lot of people are probably wondering, what, what are you thinking of right now? It's this, look. Look at, this is the picture. Third, this is this is before the murder. You remember when Gina said he, she picked up the gun, then she gave it back to Windebank just so he could show her that the item was in the, um that the item, the, the Hound of the Baskervilles, was in there. But there's no door here. Look, there's none here. It's not here right now. The camera clearly shows that. And then at 1.30, it's here. And now, I, I was originally thinking... I, what I was thinking was... I was thinking that, that the blind here was covering the door. But the reality is different. The door, that little, this, this little flap door, wasn't there at all. It didn't exist. Do you know who made that little flap door? Suzato made that little flap door. And she made that flap door so that she could see what was going on in the room. And that's when she saw Gina in there. And so what's happening now is Graydon is lying. He's saying that she put it through the little flap. But that but we know now this little flap door that was made after after Graydon had left. So he's lying about his testimony, so there's no way that Gina could have dropped, could have, if, if Gina did have the third gun, there's no way she could have dropped it out of that room. R further cross-examination. This is what I'm requesting right now. Further cross-examination. The jurors have spoken. Protocol dictates that you may not cross-examine a new witness now. The defense is not asking for the cross-examination of a new witness. Rather, to continue with one of an existing witness. What? It would appear that a rather important detail has escaped your attention, Mr. Reaper. My lord. Requesting your lordship's permission to interrupt the cross-examination. The cross-examination was interrupted. It never finished. Thank you, officer. Very well. The cross-examination is hereby temporarily suspended, so it was never ended. I presume you have no objection, counsel. Um, no, my lord. So nobody can say anything, then. If Runel asks to resume his cross-examination Mr. Graydon, the court is obliged to allow it. This is absurd. I will remind those present that this is my courtroom. I concur that the defense is entirely within its rights to request a continuation of the cross-examination. However, I will not permit an un unremitting protraction of these proceedings. Therefore, I have decided to afford the defense one final opportunity in concluding the cross-examination. 
Counsel, you must choose but one statement from the witness's testimony and but one piece of evidence to present in support of your argument against it. A single chance to present evidence. If following that, the situation remains unchanged, I shall move to adjudication. Is that clear, counsels? You will not present the witnesses, uh, press the witnesses any further. My lord. Okay, I'm gonna save right here, just to be safe, but I'm, I'm confident that I know the answer. It's that, it's that flap, um, gun. And I have to, I have to contradict him on that statement where he's saying that she put the gun through the door. I'm saving just in case I have to show the picture or something, or the game, you know, says I have to show the picture instead of the gun. Because it's only a single chance now, but I'm confident it's the gun that I have to show, that little door gun. I feel very confident in this. A single statement, a single piece of evidence. Most generous. Well then, Mr. Naruto, though, it's high time I fell in a dead faint. I leave this in your capable hands. Oh. Miss... Mr. Sholmes. He just passed out, so he ba he barely uh, got to court to bring us that evidence. To stand so insultantly before the court in a state of such high fever, either the man has extraordinary strength of mind or an extraordinary lack of feeling. I imagine he's feeling very little now. The detective is sleeping soundly in one of the antechambers. Strike a man when he's down, why don't you? Well then, counsel. Are you fully prepared? Yes. One statement. One piece of evidence. I won't let Mr. Sholmes down or Iris. Or Gina. And I won't waste this final chance that Suzato-san has given me. This is going to decide the entire outcome of the trial, okay? It's over for you, Graydon. Very well then, under the terms I have outlined, you may resume the cross-examination. I can choose only one statement and one piece of evidence. Look at how the music changes. I think it's this one because it could be the it could be either one. It could be the statement. This you see that this is exactly the reason on why I saved, because it could be the statement on um uh, it could be the statement on which he saw him through the peephole. This. I think it's it's this or the picture. Objection. What on earth is that eccentric contraption, Council? Oh. It's my cat flap a mat, my lord. It makes a way for cats to get in and out of a room. It can cut through any door you can think of, and make a new little door in the middle of it. That's right, my lord. It's a device for creating so-called cat flaps. Small doors for cats to come and go as they please. I'm right, without their owners having to open. I'm sure we can all work that out for ourselves. Ah. But that cat lover's contra... Trevance has no possible relevance in this case. No, it does. Because there was no there was no flap door beforehand. There was no flap door for her to toss the gun out. Oh, really? This is going to be good now. Now he's finished. He's done. He's trapped himself in a hole and he can't get out. Of course it doesn't. To start with, with there was no cat flap in the pawnbroker's door. Hmm. Not being a keeper of cats myself, I'm afraid I fail to see what this has to do with the matter at hand. Perhaps it would help if I described its function under our way then. This contraption is able to create a peephole in any door you can imagine in practically no time at all. I beg your pardon. A peephole, you say? Two nights ago, we arrived at the scene only minutes after the murder of Mr. Windebank had taken place. That's right. According to the paperwork at the yard, it was you, your Japanese assistant, and Sholmes. Yes, the three of us were together, and it's recently come to my attention that my assistant made use of this device at the time. Your assistant did what? There was a peephole in the storeroom door. I can attest to that. Because I looked through the peephole myself in order to see inside the locked storeroom. This is ludicrous. What are you trying to say? 
Of course, there was a peephole in the door. I said as much in my testimony. But you're finished now. Because he's, 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 he's destroying himself and he doesn't even realize it. The peephole didn't exist when, when he shot Mr. Windebank. Gina closed the door after Mr. Windebank was shot. The peephole wasn't there in the door. suzato san made that after she, she arrived. How else could I have witnessed the crime for pity's sake? Yes, how could you? What? Counsel, kindly say what you mean. All right, it's time. Time to strike the final blow. What I mean is this, my lord. My assistant made the peephole in the storeroom door, and until such time as she did, the door had no hole in it to look through. There we go. That's it. We got him. I'm so happy. This this it makes you feel so good now. You finally cracked the case. It's over. Objection. This is a farce. Are you really suggesting that the peephole in the door was... Yes, it was created only after the incident had taken place by my judicial assistant using this, this device. Your assistant tampered with the crime scene whilst being fully aware of the gravity of her actions. This is a most serious act of vandalism, for which I humbly apologize, my lord. It was in the few minutes that I left the scene in order to pursue the Skulkin brothers and alert the police. Nevertheless, in the light of this new information, it becomes apparent that Mr. Graydon's testimony is riddled with holes. Riddled with? Explain yourself, counsel. The majority of Mr. Graydon's testimony that appears to incriminate the defendant is based upon that he witnessed through the peephole in the storeroom door. Yes, that uh, filthy girl shooting the man in the back. However, if at the time of the incident that the peephole did not yet exist in the door, there's no possible way that you could have seen what, what you claim to have seen. In short, your entire testimony is a pack of lies. Order, order, order. Is is there any cre credence to, in this relevation? None whatsoever, as my learned friend must surely realize. Exactly, this is just some cheap trick designed to discredit me. I'm afraid not, sir. Of course it is. Do you seriously expect people to believe that plaything can cut through a solid wooden door? Oh yes, I delighted, uh, it, I designed it to be very powerful. It can cut through even the toughest of doors. That's absurd. I don't believe it for a second. Haha, -ha, I had a feeling you'd say that. What? Waggy, cooey, time for dinner. Look, she already made the, uh, the door here. Well? Young lady, this is the Old Bailey. One does not make half laps in the oak paneling at the Old Bailey while well, it was to make a point. <laughs> I'm, I'm not done yet, don't worry. This doesn't mean that the peephole in the storeroom door at Windebanks was made by your machine. And there's no way you can prove that it was. We can, the pictures. No, but it's easy. What? The cat flaps my cat flap on crates are all of a fixed size. And the dimensions of the peephole at Windebanks are an exact match. Heh <laughs> heh, old Silky's lost for words. Excellent work, Iris, thank you. And now it's my learned student friend's turn to be lost for words, I feel. I believe your judicial assistant has already left the country for your eastern island home. Well, yes, that's true then you may have some difficulty in establishing all of the facts. For the sake of argument, let us assume the peephole has dimensions that are perfect fit for this contraption. In that case, when was the peephole cut? The prosecutor demands proof of your answer. It was cut between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. What is the purpose of your line of inquiry, Lord Van Zeeks? It's very simple, my lord. The defense argues that the peephole was created after the incident using this device. But now that the per perpetrator has returned to her native land, she cannot testify to the fact there is no proof. Ugh. And for as long as the defense remains unable to prove when the peephole was made, my learned friend's claim amounts to nothing more than a baseless accusation. The picture. Indeed that is so, Lord Van Zeeks. Well, counsel. I, um... Don't give up now, Runo. 
This is the time to create your own opening and force your way through. I don't know if I can do this, but I do know one thing. Suzato-san is the greatest judicial assistant in the world. She left, so she created that door so th so that the that when the person brought in to to testify would lie about the door. She predicted that that would happen. Man, Suzato's really smart. Very well, the counsel for the defense will present evidence to support the claim made. Prove that the peephole in the door of Windebank Storm was created after the event and not before. Proof that it was created after the event and not before. I mean, we could show really either picture. Um, Take that. The defense believes this is all the proof the court should Objection. need. Then the defense is extremely hopeful. That proves nothing. Okay, so I guess I gotta show the first picture then. Okay. It's the first picture then. Okay. It's this one then. Take that. What are you? A print from the detective's infernal cameras again? My judicial assistant, Miss Suzato Mikotoba, is an extremely intelligent and capable woman, which is why I never had any case cause to doubt that she would have considered this scenario and made sure I had the necessary proof. And the necessary proof is this photographic print, counsel? This print shows a scene in the shop moments after the defendant entered the premises. Agreed. And it also shows the accused mercilessly wielding a gun in the direction of the defenseless broker. But more to the point. It pictures the storeroom door in the background. Let me see that print again. Yeah, look, the door. I don't believe it. This really is quite remarkable, the door to the storeroom. It completely devoid of a peephole of any description. Mr. Graydon. You couldn't possibly have witnessed the crime as you claimed to have done. Because at the time it happened, there was no peephole in the door. In other words, your testimony is a catalog of lies. Order, order, order. I am satisfied that the defense has substantiated its claims beyond all reasonable doubt. This witness's testimony was entirely, uh, fallacious. We shouldn't have put him on the stand in the first place, Judge. That's not the only thing we know now beyond all reasonable doubt. My learned friend's assistant's guilt can no longer be denied. This woman tampered with a crime scene. But more importantly... Good lord, there's more Lord Van Zeeks? The defense may have established a reprehensible inst instance of perjury. But that is no proof that this man is the victim's killer. Yes, that's right. What? I was there at the scene. It's true. And I was shot in the arm. It's true. But that's all. Yes, in fact, if you look at the circumstances, I am the victim here. No. Oh, please. I don't believe this, but they're right, as it stands now. I don't have any definitive proof that he is the culprit. Still, he can't worm his way out of it now. Iris, you know what they say. There's no point locking the cat's door after the cat has bolted. 
Isn't that right, Runo? As Hurley always says, one lie begets another. No, wait. That might have been a line I wrote for him in one of my stories. Well, no matter who said it first, you're right. Mr. Graydon, not only did you give false testimony to the court, but the lies you told make no sense. Make no sense? What do you mean by such a remark? What you said in your testimony reveals that you know something you shouldn't have known. In other words, there is a fundamental inconsistency in your own statements. What? Objection. This is provocative talk, counsel. Won't you enlighten the court? Explain this alleged inconsistency. Iris was right. One lie begets another. The inconsistency is revealed by the lies in the witness's statement. They show that Mr. Graydon had the knowledge of something he shouldn't have known about, namely... The bloodstains on the coat. It'll be the bloodstains on the coat. Yeah, it's the bloodstains on the coat. The bloodstains that were present on Miss Lestrade's coat. That's right, the victim's blood spattered all over her when she shot him. But how could you possibly have known that? Obviously, because I saw her do it through the peephole in... in the... But we just proved that there was no peephole. The point is not that you lied in your testimony, Mr. Graydon. It's the nature of the lie you concorded that is so revealing. You're not making any sense. Then let me ask you a simple question. How is it, Mr. Graydon, that you knew of the existence of the peephole in the storeroom door? What? Well, obviously, I... Ah, ugh. Uh. Has the cat got your tongue, witness? <laughs> Look at what the judge just said. <laughs> the peephole in the door was made after the incident occurred. And once I returned to the shop, having failed to catch the two burglars, Scotland Yard's investigators arrived immediately. Since that time, the police have been at Windebanks cons constantly carrying out their investigation. Isn't that right, Inspector Gregson? Um, well, yes, of course. Um, the place is chock full of pond articles, and my lads have to thoroughly examine them all. So I gave the order to have officers working around the clock and shifts so we get through it all. And consequently, there's no way that you, Mr. Graydon, could have gained access to the shop. Therefore, you should have known nothing about the peephole in the storeroom door. So the fact that it exists, forms the basis of your testimony, is completely inexplicable. Objection. And yet, the fact remains that Mr. Graydon did maintain that he wit had witnessed the crime take place through the peephole in the door. How on earth is that possible? Um... Could I have a word, please, Lord Van Zeeks? Speak, Inspector. Look, he's, he's not happy. The way he says, speak, Inspector. Even though it's, you know, I'm reading what he's saying, I can tell he's not happy. It's just that I really ought to be getting back to the station now to put in my report. No. I think that Gregson told him about the peephole. That's what he was whispering about. Remember when the two of them were whispering? I think that it was about the peephole. I think he told him that. But now, why did Gregson tell him that? Because Gregson is starting to really piss me off now at this point. There's really nothing more I can add to this testimony, so it's all the same to you. No, you're not getting out of here. Permission denied. Good, good Lord Van Zeeks. Oh. It's not all the same to me, Inspector. Not at all. You will remain exactly where you are until this trial concludes. Of, of course, sir. Mr. Graydon. You shouldn't have known about the existence of that peephole. Which can only mean... That you must have been informed about it. Somebody else. Gregson told him, but why? Why did Gregson tell him? Stop there, my learned friend. You realize, I trust, that the words you just uttered have extremely serious implications. Yes. 
but the defense believes that the details about the case that Mr. Graydon claims to have seen must have been revealed to him by a certain person before his testimony. And in fact, considering a particular clue we have, there's really only one person that could be. Who is the person in question, counsel? Who gave the witness details of the crime scene to facilitate his false testimony? It was Inspector Gregson, but why? Take that! The truth is... It can only have been you, Inspector Gregson. Eh? Me? Objection. You had better have some proof to substantiate um, uh, such a rash claim, my learned friend. Consider the fact that we have only been aware of Mr. Ashley Graydon's identity for the last few hours. We learned of it on, uh, only during the course of the trial today. Indeed, preparations for his testimony were made with great urgency during our, uh, our long recess. While the police executed the subpoena and brought the man here from the communication station. And until that time, Mr. Graydon would have had no idea, no inkling, uh, that he would suddenly be required to appear in court. Are you suggesting that until such time as he was summoned? Yes, my lord. Until then, it's reasonably to, reasonable to assume he knew nothing of the peephole. He didn't. But why did Gregson tell him? It was when they were whispering. It was only once Mr. Graydon was in the stand that he realized his position. That he would have to defend himself against the accusation that he was the third intruder. You're suggesting to the court that it was while uh, the trial was in progress that he received the information? So that he could commit perjury in order to save his skin? Exactly. And the only person with knowledge of the investigation that he had any contact with is you, Inspector Gregson. This, this is a bloomin' outrage. Why would I be giving away details of our investigation to this fella, eh? Hmm. I was summoned to his lordship's chambers during the recess in any case. Had you forgotten that? What about the one you whispered to him? And honestly, you know, Gregson, um, uh, he's, he hasn't been helpful at all during this trial. Not at all. He was a witness to when, uh, this guy pulled a gun and tried to kill, um, Ryunosuke. So, Lily, this guy pulled a gun on him earlier in the day, ran out of the shop. Gregson was clearly a witness to that, but he says, oh, I just forgot? Like, how do you forget this guy pulling a gun and running away from the scene? So, this, this guy's starting to really, um, uh, annoy me. But now the question is, why? Why, it, why did he give him this information? I had a number of questions regarding the uh, uh, events that transpired at the pawnbrokery. Which means... The first t uh, time these two la uh, laid eyes on one another was after proceedings resumed following the recess. Since then, they've been in full view in the stand, where such illicit discussions couldn't have possibly uh, have occurred. No, I beg to differ. Remember when they were whispering? Oh, I've just remembered something, Runo. What is it, Iris? There was one time before, wasn't there? I think it was when Ginny was testifying. Yup, they were whispering. That was in my video yesterday, when they were whispering um, together. Oh yes, now you mention it. When the bailiff was dispatched to retrieve McGill's music box from the scene of the crime. That's it. It was during that testimony. Remember. I remember finding it strange at the time. They were just whispering to each other. Mr. Green and the inspector seem to be having some kind of secret discussion. It would have been possible for you to give Mr. Gray the information he needed then. You little Torag, you're making all this up. I'm, I'm a respectable Scotland Yard inspector for crying out loud. Why would I do something like that? Why would I be giving away confidential details to the likes of this bloke? Admittedly, you wouldn't have had any reason to do something like that for no gain. But perhaps... It was part of a deal of some kind. Then it starts to make more sense. What deal, counsel? I wonder if perhaps in exchange for details about the peephole at the crime scene, Mr. Graydon agreed to give a certain something to the inspector. The other disc. That's what he gave him. I'm sure I need not remind the inspector that it found to be uh, true. Striking a deal of any kind of a witness would be considered a gross case of, of mal-pheasants. Well, well, I... Objection. This case is really heating up. It's becoming clear that jumping in with accusations is this Nipponese student special reality. No, this is the truth. I, I don't do that. But with the stakes so high, the prosecution is not prepared to listen to baseless charges. 
it is incumbent on the defense now to present evidence in support of this diabolical claim. Evidence. Just what are you proposing that the inspector demanded of the witness in return? The disc. The court must seek proof of this alleged deal. It's the disc. If Inspector Gregson really did strike a deal with Mr. Graydon, then logically, there's only one thing he could have asked for, the disc. That must be it. And so, the, the inspector was willing to let Gina basically rot in prison just so that he could get that disc, or Gina would have probably been executed for capital punishment. Literally, he was going to let her get sentenced to death just so he could get that disc of government secrets on it. Honestly, Inspector Gregson is a piece of crap. Runo, do you think it could be? Yes. It's the missing link that would join all the dots together in this puzzle. I must press you for an answer now, counsel. What evidence explains the nature of the alleged deal that Inspector Gregson made with the witness? I don't know what I could... Small music box? I have two chances, so I'll try on this. It has to be the music box. Take that! Inspector Gregson. Besides this murder, is it not true that you've been working on another very important case? With Lord Strongheart, what are you getting at now, Sunshine? Is it possible that this other top secret case is what's alluded in this newspaper article here? The classified secrets leaked overseas from the Ministry of Justice. How, how the bleeding Nora could you... We discovered during the course of this trial the music box deposited at Windebanks by Magnus McGilded. A special music box designed to play two discs at once. It would seem very likely now that encoded on the pair of discs that were in McGilda's possession are the leaked classified secrets. So I put it to you, Inspector, that in order to recover the second of the discs containing those secrets, you covertly made a deal with Mr. Graydon in which you exchanged the discs uh, for details of the case. You, you little... Look at that heroic music that's playing. That's, that's the theme of the game. That's the theme of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. We got it now. On the day of the incident, when we met you at Windebanks, you said this. I'll be taking that whatever it is, McGill is down to the yard. Thank you very much. So hand it over. No, don't. Don't give it to him. It's mine, that is. Mine. I'm sorry, miss. But anything belonging to McGill, it has to be taken as evidence now. Scotland Yard already knew at the time, isn't that right? That Magnus McGillid was involved in the stealing of gov government secrets. My orders were, recover the medium used to convey the secrets that leaked from the Ministry. And do it on the QT, strictly hush-hush. And that explains why, when I presented this disc as evidence to the court, you objected so heavily, I presume. Because you knew that it contained highly confidential information. Well, I mean, not likely. I mean, I wasn't sure of it myself. I realized there was a possibility, that's all. Inspector, surely... Surely you're not saying that in order to acquire the second of these music box discs, you didn't deal, reveal confidential details the crime scene to witness. To aid and abet this man in giving false testimony. There's no other way that Mr. Graydon could have known of the existence of the peephole. It's the only explanation. A deal was struck between these two men. This was a massive conspiracy. Look at how many people are involved in this. If, and I stress if, this sobering assertion turns out to be founded in truth. Look, uh, how many people? McGilded, Mason, um, Graydon, the, the Skulkin brothers, and Inspector Gregson. This is a massive conspiracy. This, this is just, this is crazy. The amount of people involved in this whole plot. If, and I stress if, this sobering assertion turns out to be founded in truth. Van Zeeks is pissed. It would mean that the second disc is as we speak, here in this very courtroom. Wait, what? In in this room? How could you possibly make a claim like that? Gregson has it, because Inspector Gregson is a Scotland Yard detective. What? What's that supposed to mean, eh? As a seasoned policeman, the Inspector will have approached this alleged deal with caution. Certainly, he would not have accepted a gentleman's agreement in this matter. 
No, he would have insisted on having the article agreed upon in the palm of his hand. Good gracious, then you mean to say he has a disc on him. Inspector Gregson already has the item in question, in his possession. He has the second disc actually on his person. Yes. The defense demands the inspector is searched at once. Definitely. They could only have struck a deal with each other when Ginny was testifying before, and Gregsy hasn't moved from the witness stand since. My lord, please, order an examination of his personal effects immediately. Hmm. Well, inspector? This young lad wants to tone down his imagination. He's insulted me and my profession quite enough. However, if it'll put this matter to bed and dispel any doubts about my involvement, then I'll happily submit to a body search. What? He's going to agree to it. I presume you're aware of the pre precipice um, uh, of on which you now teeter, my learned student friend. You've made a most serious allegation against Scotland Yard here. If following the search of the inspector's personal effects, no disc is found. You will be deemed unfit for court service. This trial will end and my country's government will formally demand of yours that you are severely reprimanded. That sounds serious. Yeah, it is, indeed. To have a visiting student make such a deformatory remarks about our country's most senior police force. It's not something Her Majesty's government will be able to overlook. You're just threatening Runo because you're scared. The accusation is beyond serious. You must be prepared for grave consequences. It's true. I can't imagine Gregson would have accepted a gentleman's agreement for something so critical. The disc must have physically changed hands, which means this inspector should have it. But somehow, something doesn't feel quite right here. Very well. Counsel, you know the implications, so let me ask you one final time. Yes, my lord. Do you still persist in formally requesting a search of inspector's personal effects? Hmm. Search someone else. But who else could have it? It could be Mr. Graydon. I'm gonna go with Mr. Graydon. And the reason I'm going with Mr. Graydon is because he seemed really confident in that. He seemed really confident. He's like, okay, if this will put it to rest, just search me. He seems really confident that they'll find no disc on him. So I don't think he has the disc on him. I think Graydon has the disc on him, and I think Graydon was going to agree to give him the disc after the trial ended. So when Graydon was going to be um, uh, released from testifying, he was probably going to agree to give um, um, Inspector Gregson the disc. So I'm going to say that it's, um, uh, I'm going to say that it's, uh, that it's Graydon. Search someone else. Yes, the defense formally demands the search to be conducted. Well, don't say you weren't warned, but your typical nippany stubbornness may well land you in hot water this time. Perhaps the lesson will do you some good. Fair enough, I've got nothing to hide. Hold it, wait. Bailiff, conduct a search of the inspector's personal effects, please. The defense demands a search, but not of Inspector Gregson. What? Now what's all this? I'm the one you're accusing, aren't I? I thought you wanted to search me. No, no. Inspector. Not you. Somebody else. What's the meaning of all this, eh? Lost it at last, have you, sunshine? This court shouldn't have uh, to put up with this nonsense. You're being completely rational. I don't think that they had enough time to swap the disc, because, again, remember when we caught when we caught them off guard when they were whispering to each other? They didn't have enough time to swap the disc. So I, And I can't imagine that the two Skulkin brothers have it. The two Skulkin brothers are idiots. You know, they would have let it slip that they have the discs. So it has to be Graydon that has it. Um, Graydon is the only person that could have the disc. All of you. Runo's doing what you all told him to do, and having the courage of his convictions. So you should respect that and listen to what he has to say in good faith. Because that's the British way.
Well said, young lady. Indeed, this court is in awe of the defense's counsel conviction and eagerly awaits his next words. You what? Now don't be hasty, my lord. If I'm not mistaken about the things I've seen in court today, I'm fairly sure that I know who has that disc at the moment. There's only one person that can be. Counsel, of whom do you request this search now? Graydon. Graydon is the only one that I can think of that has the, um, uh... Oh, great. Oh, wonderful, my... <laughs> Guys, you know what just happened? My, um, uh... My capture card literally just crashed. But not my game, my capture card. But it literally just crashed at the worst moment. <sighs> this is so crap right now. Like, like... <sighs> oh my god. Oh my god, I can't, I can't believe this just happened. My, my cap- I'm, I'm not joking on this. My capture card literally just crashed at, like, the crucial moment in the trial. It literally just froze up on me. And look, I can still- I can still- I can still move it around. I, oh, my god. Hang on one moment. I'm sorry, everyone. This is- this just sucks so much. Ugh. Okay, here we go. Oh, my god. I mean, that, that's- what are the chances of that, that happening? That is just... Okay. Okay, Ashley Graydon, here we go. So it's Graydon that, um, uh... Graydon is the one who has the disc on him. I'm fairly confident in that. I mean, let's just review everyone. No. 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 No, no, no. Graydon is the only one that could have it. Take that! Mr. Ashley Graydon, my lord. The defense demands that he be searched at once. Very well. I presume you will not protest, Mr. Graydon. A contraire. And so a brief body search was carried out by the court bailiff. A few short minutes later, it was revealed that Mr. Graydon had nothing unusual in his personal what? Well, counsel. There's only one person that can be. Okay, I'm saving right now. I. Who else could have it here? Van Zeeks? I mean, I, I don't know how Van Zeeks get it. Lord Strongheart, maybe. Maybe they had a deal at the office, but... I don't think that in an hour time they would have enough time to... To do all of that. The Skulkin Brothers? But why would the Skulkin Brothers have it? It's definitely not Suzato, not Sherlock, not Iris, not Windebank, not uh, Gina, not Graydon, not Tobias. It just leaves me with these four, here. I can't imagine it being Zeke's. It's either Strongheart or the, the Skulkin Brothers. I'm gonna go with the Skulkin Brothers. Take that! It must have been that they slipped the disc into them or something. Of my lord, uh, Mr. Nash Skulkin. Well, I never. Eh? Hey, blimey. Me. Very well then, Bailiff. Refrain to witnesses and conduct a thorough search of his personal effects. Please, my lord. Oh, wait. Look at that. The inspectors all... Scotland Yard, um, has to object to this search. Objection. Unfortunately for you, Inspector, your objections carry no weight here. Eh? In this courtroom, only the prosecution and the defense have the authority to object. <laughs> But, but, Lord Van Zeeks, I have no idea what forces are in play that might influence your actions. 
but personally, I have no intention of obstructing the course of this trial. Ah. Bailiff, carry out the search. Now old Anno Mo, I don't know nothing. Nothing about no disc. Cut it out. Here, my lord. In the witness's pocket. I found this. Good lord, that's... Another music box disc. I don't know nothing about it, nothing. How did they get the disc, though? That was my question. I was sure that it was either Gregson or, or Graydon that had it. Well, I thought it was Graydon. That is the second music box disc left behind a Magnus McGilded. Is it not, Inspector Gregson? Ah. Uh. Order, order, order. Mr. Skulkin, what have you stated for yourself? Gordon Bennett, I mean, I just... Gordon Flamin Bennett. I swear I didn't know nothing about that disc. Honest to God. Counsel, would you please explain what exactly is going on here? They had to have... The alleged yellow struck between this witness... And this detective, no. How did the Skulkin brothers get it, though? It had to have... I don't think that they gave it to them. It has to have been slipped to them. Without question, my lord. Then for pity's sake... Why on earth was this man in possession of the disc the inspector traded for information? Inspector Gretchen is a shrewd, calculating man, who rarely loses his composure. But at one particular point in the trial, he exhibited some unusual behavior for a brief moment. Oh, the shaking! The shaking, when he was shaking him. The disc flew into him when he was shaking him. That's it, I don't recall, one unusual behavior. So the Skulkin brothers don't really, really don't know about the disc, they don't. It was, it was put into them, it, it was put into his coat. It was, yes, during my cross-examination of Mr. Graydon. Tell me, Mr. Graydon, when you left the pawnbrokery that night, was it by any chance with the second disc in your jacket pocket? I admit to nothing of the sort. While Mr. Graydon answered my questions, the inspector appeared to have grabbed Nash Skulkin by his coat and was shaking him violently. Yeah, he did and all. Thought me noggin was gonna fall off clean, I did. I was wishing I'd been, uh, born as me brother I was. And what exactly happened to make the detective attack you like that? I ain't got a clue. He just suddenly turned and grabbed me while uh, whistling like that and started shaking me. So it was his attempt to dispose of evidence. Why the blaze didn't you mention the third gun when we got you down the station, that's what he said. Yelled it right down in my ear, all he did. Me Ed's still throbbing now. Hmm. The way the detective behaved then was extremely out of character. But looking back now, it must have been then that he did it. That was the opportunity Inspector Gregson created for himself in order to hide the disc. Well, bless my wig, he hid it. You but I'm afraid I failed to comprehend the motive here. If the detective had acquired a disc he was after, why on earth would he then proceed to hide it in another man's pocket? This is a court of law. He could have submitted the item as evidence. It would appear, my lord, that the inspector was not at all liberty to do that. What, why ever not? As the man himself revealed earlier, his current assignment has some special conditions. My orders were... Recover the medium used to convey the secrets leaked from the Ministry. And do it on the QT, strictly, um, hush, hush. Hush, hush, a top secret assignment, is it? As far as we're aware, the information stolen comes from confidential government communications. It would seem that if the information were to be revealed in court as evidence, it would be problematic. Does that sum up the situation, Inspector? I'm operating under direct orders from the Ministry. I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to answer that question. So, realizing there was a chance that you may be searched here in court, you took the steps to hide the disc you had acquired from the witness. Ah, uh, does this mean... He only pretended to attack Mr. Skulk in order to get close enough to him to slip the second disc into his pocket. So it was all a pretense. Well now, Inspector Gregson, and you, Mr. Graydon, 
Are you prepared to admit to the accusation made against you of all the, of this alleged deal? Admit to it. Yours truly, please. Mr. Graydon. Clearly, our Eastern visitor has an uncommonly active imagination. However, there's no proof that I passed that disc to the inspector. Objection. But, but then, how do you explain the reason you knew about the peephole? I'm under no obligation to explain. What? Yes, I lied in my testimony. That I admit, so sentence me accordingly. But that is all I admit. Murder? Leaking government secrets? Striking a deal with a detective? All of it... All of it is this young Eastern man's fantas fancy. I have no idea what any of this is about. You. What? Well, what about you then, Inspector Gregson? Do you admit to making a deal with Mr. Graydon to acquire the disc? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as a Scotland Yard inspector, I will declare this and nothing more. I am acting in the best interest of the country. Whatever I've done, it's been in the name of justice. So, as members of the public of this fine country, I'd like to think that justice will be your guiding light when you're making your decisions. Hmm, this is quite a quandary indeed. Rarely have I encountered such extraordinary uh, tum tumultuousness in the concluding of a trial. Nevertheless, in the absence of any further evidence to be presented, I believe it is time that we put the matter to the jury for their final leanings. Well now, as a fellow servant in the Queen and Country, I must say I sympathize with the old inspector. Yes, he's a dependable man, I'm quite sure, in service one becomes a good judge of character. Even crossing your eyes doesn't help when it comes to looking at this case. It's all blurred to me. Well, as a fellow professional, I'd like to put my faith in this detective, really. Graydon is highly skilled operator. Stop. Currently in presence of idle. Stop. Detective has very much trust in eyes. More than this, I cannot say. I don't believe it. These six jurors are. They're going to believe Gregson. If they declare their decision now. Is Ginny going to be found guilty? If I don't manage to produce some definitive ev evidence right now, then we're going to lose. Either some proof that Graydon killed Mr. Windebank, or stole those government secrets. Or some evidence to force Gregson into admitting that he struck a deal with the witness. Well then, counsel. I think it's time I imposed on the jurors to declare their final decisions, no? That is, unless you have some compelling evidence you have thus thus far not presented to the court. Oh man, Gregson's such a piece of crap that he's about to allow Ginny to go to, um, a uh, prison or be executed. If I let the judge call and the jurist announce their leanings, Gino will be found guilty. So there's no choice then, Runo. You have to throw some ev more evidence at them. This is it now. It all comes down to this. Who do I present evidence against, Gregson or Graydon? Hmm. Damn. What evidence could I present here? I'm gonna save here. Okay. Now here's what I'm gonna go for. I'm gonna see if I can play both music box discs at once. I'm gonna present evidence against Graydon.
Graydon. Mr. Graydon, there is one final piece of evidence I would like you to see. Hmm, you misguided fool. Whatever you intend to show me now, you'll be wasting your time. I have nothing left to lose. I assure you, I will admit to nothing. This is my last chance. It looks like I'm going to have to force his hand here. One final piece of evidence to get him to admit to the deal he clearly struck on the stand. Now that we have both discs, we could play them. That's what I'm thinking. Take that! Is that Mr. McGillis' peculiar music box council? Looks like I'm right. Yes, with a disc already in place, ready to play. I think perhaps now would be a good time to listen to the sound produced by the music box again. Only this time... ...with the second disc we've just discovered as well. Goodness, this disc council... No, wait. I, I can't let you do that. Why not? Because, um, well... Because it's got nothing to do with this case, that's why. Objection. Not true, Inspector. It has everything to do with this case. So I'm right, it's the music box. The defense already proposed that the sounds heard by the court earlier from this music box were part of a Morse code message. We know that Morse code compromises of two distinct tones. The defense believes that the second disc contains the second tone needed to complete the message. And now we have a chance to confirm that theory. For crying out loud, Sunshine, we're talking about state secrets here. If you go letting the whole courtroom hear confidential information like that, it's... It's treason. You know what I think is treason? I think it's treason that you're gonna let this poor girl go to prison, possibly be executed. Lily, for this, these so-called government secrets, I think that's treason. That you're not even gonna defend this, um, girl. Then do you admit the charge? That in order to protect those state secrets, you engage in unlawful dealings with the witness. You're... you're mad. If you let that secret information out into the public domain, you'll... you'll be making an enemy of the entire British government, you idiot. Let's not forget, Inspector, that you, a Scotland Yard officer, leak confidential case details to a witness, that you continue to lie to the court, and all because by a fair means or foul, you're determined to do your duty. Well, by fair means or foul, I'm prepared to do mine. That's good there. Don't you dare. I will stop at nothing to protect my client. I don't care uh, who I make an enemy of. Oh, that's good. My lord, if you please, the court must hear the sounds made by that music box. Come on, Van uh, Zeeks, for Pete's sake, stop him. Objection! Inspector, you should know my methods by now. I'm a prosecutor. I'm no Scotland Yard puppet. Ugh. In this courtroom, my duty is to the law. So let me propose a toast. To uncovering the truth. By fair means or foul. Very well. The defense's stance here and that of the prosecution has been made very clear, I feel. Therefore, in accordance with the defense's request, the court will now listen to the music box is set in operation once more. This time, with the second disc in place and both discs playing simultaneously, look at them, they're both they're both so scared. What is that translating to? All right, all right, I admit it, but for the love of God, shut off the box.
Let me ask you again then, Inspector Gregson. Did you or did you not strike a deal with the witness next to you in the stand, Mr. Ashley Graydon? Specifically, did you furnish the witness with confidential case details in exchange for this music box disc? Did you reveal the existence of the peephole in the pawnbroker storeroom door, Inspector? I did. Stop! What are you doing, man? It's all exactly like the young Eastern lawyer said. When the trial resumed after the recess and we were stood here in the stand together. That's when he approached me with the deal. Shut up, you imbecile. Shut up. S you there. You're the detective who turned up at the pawnbroker the other day, aren't you? I may have something you're looking for, Inspector. With me at this very moment. So how about a trade? I suggest you accept. Or information that may make uh, certain individuals uncomfortable will soon become very public indeed. I couldn't let that information become public knowledge. Not under any circumstances. So I accepted the man's proposal and told him details about the case that should have put him in the clear. The peephole in the storeroom door and the bloodstains on the overcoat. By giving false testimony, this witness intended to have the defendant wrongly accused of murder. <sighs> Inspector, you knew that. Yet you still revealed those details to facilitate the witness's perjury. Exactly, he was gonna let uh, Gina literally go to prison. What a piece of crap. I mean, screw this detective. I did. But then it turned out the peephole had only been made that night after the incident took place. Scotland Yard wasn't aware of that, if I'm perfectly honest. Well, Mr. Graydon, what do you have to say for yourself? Uh, uh... There's nothing and no one left for you to hide behind. You struck a deal with the inspector in order to escape conviction of a very serious crime. Namely this. You are the third intruder who broke into the pawnbrokery on the night in question. And you perpetrated the murder of the proprietor, uh, Mr. Pop Windebank. You. You. Traitor. Oh, he's trying to strangle the detective. Bailiff, bailiff, restrain that man at once. Well, I can't say that I feel bad for um Inspector Gregson. That's it then. It's all over. I despise my life growing up. Those slums are vile places. I was cursed from birth, born into poverty, the son of a penniless art artisan. My parents did nothing but quarrel all day long. What little money they had was never spent on me. So I set about studying, to better myself, to one day escape from that hellhole. And you eventually became a communications officer. I admire your determination. But then you decided to try to sell government secrets. Why? Isn't it obvious? Because I wanted money. Even now, years later, the nightmares of my life in the slums wake me, up, wake me in the small hours. I wanted to drown them out, with more money than anyone who lived in that squalor could ever imagine. Then one day, I met him. Mr. Magnus McGilded. You're a fiend with a queer talent, so you are. I've money to throw your way if you're interested. All you need to do is go along with me, little plan now. I was to steal the Ministry's telegraphic message logs, and the Gilded would buy them for a handsome sum. As I was responsible for inspections of the Ministry's communications office, it was a simple enough task. The lure of the devil's offerings. How easy it is to succumb. But you must surely have realized the seriousness of the crime you were committing. And for that reason, I took great lengths to ensure that my actions were untraceable. By using the music box. My father was a brickmaker, though my mother divorced him when I was still a child. 
Yes, Mr. Mason Milverton. That's right, he was very skilled with his hands. He'd uh, once been a music box maker's apprentice. I imagine his skills would be sufficient to create a machine that could generate Morse code. So I sought out my father again, to employ his services. It was the first time I'd seen him since I left the slums, uh, ten years earlier. Look at you, Ashley. What a fine gent you've become, eh? He was a different man to the one in my memory, a thin, frail old man. But poverty had never broken him, never corrupted him like it had me. I was sure that he wouldn't, uh, help me if I told him the real reason, so I made up a story. I've got some work for you, father. I need some music box discs made. Music box discs, eh? A musician friend of mine has written some music he wants to sell to the public. I brought the score with me. There are two, actually. I'd be delighted, son. It's been 20 years since I did any work like this, though, so his father was actually a good guy and he didn't know what he was getting into. Fetch my tools, would you? They're in the loft. That's how I had him make those the two discs. Thereby splitting the information in two. You were taking considerable precautions indeed. It was to protect myself as much as anything. It meant that I could deal with McGilded in two separate transactions. The first involved the first of the two discs and the music box for playing them. I exchanged them with McGilded for uh, ten... Oh, well, that's a lot of money then. Then, on receipt of the second disc, he would pay a thousand. So, what happened on the Omnibus two months ago? Was the second part of a deal? The exchange of the second disc? Yes. I sold the man information that way a number of times already, but it seems he became reluctant to part with his money. But that doesn't quite make sense, Mr. Graydon, for why was it that on the Omnibus two months ago, your father, Mr. Milverton, was the one uh, dealing with Mr. McGilded and not yourself? When I received a thousand after my first completed dealing with McGilded, I decided to give two hundred to my father for his troubles. My father realized something was amiss. In time, he worked out that I must be involved in something, dubious. And when he did, he said to me, Next time there's an exchange, you'll let your old man do it, understand? Otherwise, I won't take your money anymore. That was my father's way of dealing with it, I suppose. Climb into the omnibus, hand over the second disc, and take the money from McGilda, that's it. He had no idea what was actually on the discs I'd asked him to make. He never knew. Just like I'll never know why everything went so horribly wrong that night. All I know is that the disc was taken from him, and he never returned home. It was only then that I found out what sort of a monster McGilded really was. So after ten years of not once othering it, I swore my father's name. To exact revenge. Revenge? As anyone with even the remotest knowledge of the man will no doubt be able to imagine. So he's the one who killed McGilded. McGilded brought all his wealth and influence to bear in the most despicable of ways. To crush any sense semblance of justice in his trial. The crime scene was tampered with, evidence was fixed, and witnesses were bribed. That trial two months ago was a farce from the start to the finish. I actually agree with Van Zeeks on that. My feet had barely touched British soil back then, and I walked into that hornet's nest completely unaware of that sinister background to it all. I made plenty of money out of my dealings with McGilded by then. So I spared nothing in my arrangements two months ago. I knew exactly who to hire. If you're willing to pay the price, there are people in this city willing to do anything you ask. McGilded himself had shown me that. Are you saying that... I think you have the picture now. After he twisted everything in his favor in this courtroom to ensure that he walked free. I took matters into my own hands and delivered the justice the monster deserved. That tragic accident following the trial here two months ago was planned and executed by yours truly. McGilda's death that day, so the Reaper had nothing to do with it, so I was right. McGilda's death that day was caused by this man. 
Everything is ready, sir, if you'd like to follow me into the courtroom. What's this, officer? This sooner than I was led to believe. I hope it's not inconvenient, sir. There were some changes to the schedule. Well, I must be making tracks now. This time for the inspection. They're going to examine the omnibus again, so I'm told. I asked if I could be present for it myself. So that policeman who came to tell McGill that he could examine the omnibus again. That's right. An imposter. Hired by me. McGill had used his wealth to manipulate the trial. He paid people to adul adulterate the omnibus with all manner of false evidence. He threatened witnesses to lie in their testimony. So I gave the man a taste of his own medicine. Once the omnibus was doused in para paraffin, what's that? I'm assuming that's something flammable. One of my sham policemen ushered McGilded inside and sent him on a one-way journey to hell. An eye for an eye. That's how I avenged my father's death. A spine-chilling account, indeed. But that wasn't the end of it for me. There was a loose end, you see. A loose end. Yes, I should think it's obvious. The second disc, which my father had taken to exchange with McGilded. Ah, yes. There was indeed no mention of it in the man's trial two months ago. Clearly because it had been removed from the scene of the crime. When I realized it was missing, I remembered something. Something from the first time I dealt with McGilded. This is the first of the two discs, and the music box need to play them. Well, look at that now. What an ingenious little invention. So then, as promised, 10 for, uh, for ye young man. What's this? Windebank's pawnbrokery. Aye, this a pawnbroker's ticket, so it is. You can use it to redeem an article deposited there for ye. There's no need to give a name, just hand over the ticket and tell the fiend uh, the watchword. I've put a jewel in pawn for ye. I'll fetch a good, uh, if you sell it, um, so it will. I've never heard of a pawnbroker being used in quite that way before. Have ye not, Mr. Graydon? London's pawnbrokeries are very useful places, you know. Each one is like an extremely secure vault. So I knew that if he'd taken steps to hide the disc, it would be in that pawn brokery somewhere. And that on the night he killed my father, he must have entrusted a ticket to someone. Yes, to Gina. I remember now, and when we first met you at Windebanks that afternoon two days ago, you had a description of Miss Lestrade written down. How did you know who you were looking for? From the trial, that pickpocket's testimony is clearly pecu peculiar. Anyone could see that. I realized immediately that she was another of McGilda's pawns, that she, uh, he must have threatened her somehow. I was fairly convinced it would be her who had the ticket, so I started to make some inquiries. I had a strong suspicion the girl would come out of the woodwork on the redemption deadline. And he was absolutely right. And yes, sure enough, she did. All I needed to do was wait until the girl went to Windebanks to redeem the articles. But unfortunately, she redeemed only McGilda's overcoat and the one disc that was in its pocket. The all-important music box with the second disc inside was missing. Because it had already been forfeited two days earlier. But I was unaware of that fact. Had I not been, I could have avoided my nighttime excursion. Meanwhile, as our investigation of the stolen government secrets were progressing, we picked up on the fact that McGilda was involved. Inspector, you've recovered fast. My orders were to recover the stolen information as quickly as possible. So we started gathering at the fellow's possessions and examining whatever we could lay our hands on. We had a full-scale investigation going on at the yard, but we had to keep it as qui quiet as we could. Then, when the inspector here took the disc from me in the pawn brokery that day, I became nervous. I was sure the music box and the second disc were still there in the shop somewhere, so I knew that it was a race against time. I had to find those articles before the police did. So that's what prompted you to break into the place that same night. 
with the help of your old friends, the Skulkin brothers. What happened that night in the pawnbrokery? I can only describe as a nightmare. While Nash and Ringo were searching the counter, I located the music box I sold to McGilded on the shelves of forfeited articles, and the second disc was inside. Yes, I slipped it into my pocket with a very deep sigh of relief. But then, something entirely unexpected happened. What are you doing in my shop? A gunshot rang out in the shop, and I felt a sharp pain in my left arm. The broker fired his gun, and the bullet pierced your limp. Yes, exactly. But unfortunately, I decided to bring my own gun with me that night, just in case. Before I knew what was happening, I'd fired back. The man had already turned to flee, I hadn't intended to fire in his direction, much less kill him. But unfortunately for both of us, the bullet hit home. I'd, it struck him in the middle of his back as he fled through the storeroom door for refuge. A sorry, sorry tale. It all took place in the blink of an eye. I don't imagine Nash and Ringo even realized what had happened at first. It was I was terrified, so I fled. And that's the whole story. That's everything that happened at Windabanks on that wretched night. Wow, so everyone's silent. Now, the, are the jurors going to still be stupid, or are they still going to declare guilty? Earlier, you called McGilded a monster. A man who used his wealth and influence to distort the facts and escape justice for the crime of murder. What tragic irony. For what you have done is exactly the same. He's right. You've become the very monster you saw and despised so deeply in McGilded. Yes, I think I have. Well, this has been a long and exhausting trial, it has. However, it would seem that at last we have arrived at the truth. Inspector Gregson, what of Mr. Ashley Graydon? He's been restrained, my lord, and is being escorted to the yard. He'll be charged with the murder of Mr. Windebank and the stealing government secrets. You know what that is? That means death penalty. Very good. And you, Inspector. Regrettably, you will have to face charges yourself. Good. Yes, my lord. Of course. And the thing is, though, I'm not even pissed about him, like, trying to protect the government secrets. That's not even what I'm really pissed about. What I'm pissed about is the fact that he was going to let Gina literally go to um, prison or be executed for that murder. That's what I, I, I really didn't like about him. It transpires that you were complicit in helping a criminal escape justice. The fact remains, whether or not you were doing so in the line of duty. The crime is a serious one, Inspector. And inexcusable. Now to the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. Ah, uh, yeah? It is time for the final adjudication. Is the jury ready, Mr. Foreman? Yes, sir. Garrett of Squadron standing by, sir. This is, is uh, really it now. The last push, the final call, the finishing whistle. My men are ready to deliver their verdicts. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Very well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You will now declare your final decisions to the court. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. That's the stuff. I'm off the hook. Finally, Runo, you finally managed to do it. Finally is the word. I really wasn't sure if we'd come out on the top for a while. Susie was right. You're the best lawyer in the world. Miss Lestrade, I'm not finished with you yet. 
Hey, what, what are you looking at me like that for? Before you start enjoying your freedom, there are certain other crimes to consider, hmm? Hey? Two months ago, in my courtroom no less, you gave false testimony, did you not? And in relation to the trial today, not only did you unlawfully enter Windebank's pawnbrokery, you also attempted to abscond with Mr. McGilda's property, it seems. Eh? I never done nothing of the sort. Ugh, of course not. It's not like you were gleefully wearing McGilda's coat in your cell yesterday or anything. Ah, and just when I was getting excited about throwing a party for Ginny this evening. And turning our attention to the fence. Determining that, when played together, the music box this considered contained a message in Morse code was, well, it was certainly a most unexpected revelation, Council. Quite so, my lord. The prosecution was caught entirely off guard. In fact, I think we should applaud my learned friend's courage here today. I propose a toast. To demanding that government secrets be disseminated before the entire courtroom. Ah. Very sorry about that. It was the only way that I could get Inspector Gregson to admit what he'd done, so... If I may say something on that point... Isn't that... It's, um, about the sounds produced by the music box before. I do wonder... If that was really Morse code at all. What? What are you saying, madam? Oh, well. It's just that I'm really rather f fanatical when it comes to Morse code, you see. So much so... That the whole world seems to be covered in dots and dashes to me, in fact. Goodness, madam. An unhealthy level of obsession one feels. But I must say that in my opinion, the sounds produced by those two discs... ...were nothing more than that. A meaningless series of two different tones. What? Can, can that really be? It wasn't Morse code after all? My lord, the defense would like to listen to that music box again. Are you off your nut? How many times do I have to tell you? Those discs contain a uh, ministerial secret, Sunshine. This courtroom is not an appropriate forum to discuss the nature of the government communications. We know McGill did conspire to trade national secrets for our enemies, secrets acquired from Mr. Graydon. Now that the man has admitted to his crimes, we have no need to pursue the matter further. Ugh, but it's really going to bother me. Miss Lestrade. Yeah, me lord. Th that which you have seen today in this courtroom has been extremely disturbing. Falsified evidence, intimidation, perjury, a grim catalog of depravity. An appalling experience to befall any child. Come on, it ain't nothing I don't see most days in the back slums. I beg your pardon. If you're weak, you pay for it. That's just how life goes. Gina. But look, I reckon I've worked something uh, out today. The world ain't fair, but if you want it to change, you've got to uh, start at home. You've got to change how you are yourself. Well, that's a very laudable lesson, I would say. I eagerly look forward to the born again Miss Lestrade never gracing my courtroom with her presence again. Now, with regard to the murder of Mr. Pop Windebank, proprietor of a pawn brokery business on Baker Street, I hereby declare the defendant Miss Gina Lestrade. We did it. Not guilty. Oh, it's fireworks from that gun now, too. That is all. Court is adjourned. What about what happened to Ryanosuke that the judge said he'd speak to him? On a personal note, I must say you've surprised me, my far eastern friend. Ah. Oh. Despite being a Nipponese, you saw through the pretense to the malice that festered within that Englishman, and at the same time, saw through the grime to the surprising heart of your English client. 
You have a curious talent for judging character, especially considering our very different cultures. I don't think there's anything curious about it. Whether we're from the Empire of Great Britain or the Empire of Japan, we're all human beings. We're not so very different on the inside, that's right. You know, I took this case for one very simple reason. To lock swords with you once again, here in the courtroom. So that's why he came back to this case. You did. When I encountered you for the first time two months ago, it reminded me... ...of toasting friendship and trust with another Nipponese, only to find my trust betrayed. Through you, I hope to look into the eyes of the man I once knew, and try to understand. You mentioned something similar earlier today, about total betrayal at the hands of the Japanese. What happened exactly? Well, you may ask. And one day, when the time comes, you will learn to answer, whether you like it or not. What is that supposed to mean? Alright, then I'll wait for that day if I must. Oh no, my... My capture card crashed again. Such bad luck today. Coming to be known as the Reaper of the Bailey in my retirement from service five years ago. It gives me cause to wonder if our meeting has some deeper purpose. How many of those glasses are you going to smash? So farewell, my learned Nipponese fellow. Until we meet again. Wonder what he's talking about. He says he got betrayed. The Old Bailey Defendant's Antechamber. It's done. It's over at last. But... I wonder where where is Iris disappeared to? Ah. Congratulations, Gina. I knew it all along. I knew that you were innocent. Well, you did what you said, Mr. Narodo. You believed in me right up to the end. You're as odd as your name. What's odd about it? I told you, I had faith in you, didn't I? No one ever as before, see? Count the promise, I mean. Properly. That's awful. I figured something out today. All me life growing up in the slums. I've never trusted no one. But that's just because I've been scared of being stabbed in the back. I mean, the more you trust someone, the more it hurts when they let you down. Yes, I think I can understand that. After all, I had a taste of that in the trial two months ago. I chose to trust someone and paid for it. That betrayal left a big scar. You know though, Gina, I worked something out quite recently too. Trusting in someone else is really an exercise in learning to trust yourself. And when your gut tells you it's the right thing to do, and your trust is rewarded, there's no better feeling in the world. I think I have you to thank for reminding me of the valuable lesson. Oh, well, if you say so, don't make a fat load of sense to me. I'm trying to say that putting my faith in you, Gina, has been a real pleasure. For crying out loud, pack it in. But I suppose... I sort of feel the same way. I mean, sometimes trusting someone else is, you know, alright. Thanks. This is the way I see it, R Rina Suke. A defense lawyer is only as good as his faith in his client. And that comes down to how much faith he has in himself. After this experience, I'm starting to feel like I understand what you mean. 
Kazuma, am I living up to your expectations? Am I turning out to be the lawyer you believed I could be? Pardon the interruption. But what the deuce does a man have to do to be noticed around here? Is that Herlock, my dear fellow? Uh, that, that voice. It's too late for that, that voice now, Mr. Naruto. I've been standing here patiently in the corner of the room for an eternity. Ha ha ha, yes. It was me all along. I would have said when you finally noticed me. But you people, with your <laughs> incessant babbling. Ah, uh, Mr. Sholmes. Aha, uh -huh, yes, it was me all along. You see? I'd, I'd assume you'd been taken back to the hospital, um, to be honest. Indeed I was, but I managed to escape again. Oh. I happen to be aware of one or two fo foibles of the doctor who was tending to me. I merely made m my knowledge of them known to the man, and he happily issued me with a leave of absence. How very above board. But enough of me advent my adventures. That was a fine victory, Mr. Naruto. Your tireless efforts just rewarded, I feel. Congratulations are in order. As a close friend, I tip my hat at you. Oh, um... Thank you. Hmm. Some great detective you are. Great at being cold as ice, maybe. Have I irked you in some way, Miss Lestrade? While you've been having a snooze in your nice soft bed, some of us have been fighting for our lives. Ah well, that bullet did cause me to lose a substantial amount of blood, it's true. So I've indeed been feeling somewhat, uh, cold. Not perhaps as cold as ice, but well... Have a feel. Could you take your hands off my neck, please, Mr. Sholmes? <laughs> and, in some way, I suppose, congratulations are in order for you too, Miss Lestrade. What's that supposed to mean? Why so s half arted Well, naturally, it isn't my intention to alarm you, but... An acquittal in a trial with that particular prosecutor is perhaps a little precarious. Well done, Mr. Sholmes. Not alarming in the slightest. Oh, the Reaper, you mean. Because anyone who's found not guilty in a trial was he was working on winds up dead anyway, is that it? The very point I was trying to make. And, and as exemplified by the fate of Mr. McGillard, in fact. Ah, uh, but of course, I pay no attention to such irrational drivel myself. Yeah, well, it don't bother me. Oh, really? Of course not. The way I see it, the Reaper is a bit like I'm upstairs. Him upstairs, you mean? Like God? Yeah, I'm upstairs knows what's what, right? Uh, he knows what people are like on the inside. He won't have got the wrong end of the stick. There are some coves like that bog trother what are rotten to the core. At the end of the day, I'm upstairs make sure they get what they deserve. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Divine justice is one thing, though. The Reaper's taking matter into his own hands, and claiming lives is another. Well, I ain't like the McGildans of this wor world, so I ain't scared. I got principles, see? A trait in you, uh, which is to be admired, Miss Lestrade. Oi, just give it a rest, alright? As I was saying, congratulations are in order. The news of your acquittal was very welcome news to me indeed. Let me express my heartfelt congratulations, Gina. Well, um, Erm. There you are, Hurley. How long have you been there? There. Honestly, I went to the main entrance especially to meet you there. Ah, Iris, my dear. I do apologize. But wait until I tell you what happened. This pair made other fools of themselves. What happened? As you know, I have a penchant for disguise. I was hiding in this room dressed as a bailiff. But these dolts didn't notice my presence at all. They had no idea. Can you imagine, Iris? Would you credit it? Hmm. I'm not sure, really. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, Hurley, but you just don't have the weighty presence you seem to think you have. In fact, you really ought to be careful about that. It's going to land you in trouble one day. I'll be careful. Ouch. Anyway, it's such a shame. 
I was so hoping to throw a party for Ginny tonight, but you won't be able to come, will you? Don't look like I'm gonna be uh, going nowhere for a while. You heard the judge's patter. I got stuff to make amends for, apparently. All them offenses. What was it again? Breaking and entering, taking the bog trotter stuff, what was it lug, blah blah blah. Yes, I think you'll find that basically being a pickpocket is the main offense. But diving ain't an offense, it's a job, in it? I don't think so. Well, that's pretty much a crime. Still, it has got me thinking all this. Maybe I should start looking for another line of work. I mean, you didn't start off as a lawyer, did you, Otto? Well, no. But I was never a pickpocket. Well, anyway, I reckon I could make a change. I'm gonna do something, um, uh, for all them lot like me from the slums. Something that makes a difference for him. That's a wonderful idea, Ginny, and I'm sure you can do it. Heh 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 heh. What was it? Nothing. Miss Gina Lestrade. The prison carriage has arrived, ma'am. Come with me to the rear gate at once. Right. Well, looks like I'm off then. Yes, uh, goodbye, Gina. And good luck. Um, uh, Otto. Yes? Is she gonna say thank you? Ah, what was that for? I, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say, so... Ah, indeed. Perhaps the situation calls for a phrase hit har hardo missing from your vocabulary, Miss Lestrade. Eh? On occasions such as this, I would recommend a simple thank you. Oh. Oh, yes. It's good advice, Ginny. Right, I see. Well... Th thanks, Otto. Thank you for everything, what you've done. For believing in me. Now oh, she actually said thank you. Not at all. In fact, that should be my line. Thank you, uh, Gina. Well, there she goes. I wonder if I'll ever see her again. Well, well, quite the in indomitable pick purse. Oh, I nearly forgot. I bought a paper outside. It's a special edition, and this trial is all over the front page. Pickpockets innocence proven. Isn't it wonderful? You should have shown it to Gina, Iris. She would have been thrilled. Oh no, how silly of me. Ah, uh, but anyway, would you like the good news or the bad news? Uh, not again. Well, what do you say, Runo? Hurley? As usual, I think I'd rather to get the bad news out of the way first. Absolutely not. I have no intention of listening to anything but good news. And there you have it. How people answer that question says a lot about them, doesn't it? Let's not go there. Alright then, maybe let's start with the good news this time. The rain has finally stopped. It was a record level of rainfall, apparently. Well, that is good news indeed. We can journey back in greater comfort. Alright then, what's the bad news? The huge storm has left the seas very choppy. The channel in particular is awful, so sailings out of the Dover have been delayed by a day or more. Wait, Dover? That's right, if we head to the station immediately, we may still make it time to wave Susie off. Oh. I thought she was long gone, but, but... There won't be a train, surely. We couldn't be that lucky. Who do you think I am, Mr. Naruto? Uh, Mr. Sholmes? I rushed to Victoria Station earlier and made arrangements for a special express. If we hurry now, we shall be there in time for dinner. And I know of a fine restaurant that serves the most delicious baked soul. 
I don't. The Great Detective does it again. Indeed, he does. I happen to be aware of a number of the rail transport director's uh, foibles. What? I merely made my knowledge of them known to, to, uh, to the man, and he happily laid on the locomotive elementary. Just an idea, but it might be wise to stop manipulating people that way. <laughs> yep. What are we waiting for, then? To London, Victoria. Man, this case was really long. Like, really long. Like, this is um, three hours. This is one of my longest videos ever. 18th April, 5.32 a.m. Port of Dever, uh, Quayside. That took somewhat longer than I anticipated. Susie's boat must be about to leave now. Miss Suzato, where are you? Oh, there she is. Over there, look. It looks like she's reading something. Miss Suzato, wait. What are you doing? Mr. Mr. Naruto, what are you doing here? We came as soon as we could after the trial. I mean, we heard that the sailings were being delayed due to the bad weather, you see. Oh, I... I see. Then, tell me, how did Gina's trial go? It went well. She was acquitted. That's wonderful. Really wonderful news. The book you were about to throw into the sea. It was your Encyclopedia of British Law, wasn't it? Oh dear. I was hoping you hadn't seen that. I'm not worthy of practicing law in any way now. So I was saying my final farewell. You were saying goodbye to law, you Suzato-san? Would I be correct in assuming? It's because of the peephole, Miss Suzato. I deliberately altered the scene of a crime, and then I tried to hide the fact. What I did is utterly unforgivable. That reminds me. How did you even come to have this, Susie? On the evening of the incident, Mr. Sholmes had invited Gina to dinner. If you remember. Oh yes, we had a wonderful time. Well, Gina gave us a little introductory lesson, didn't she? To the art of pickpocketing, I mean. Oh, that was so much fun, I stole Runo's armband. Yes, please don't do that again, Iris. That band's very important to me. Well, if it's so important, you should pay more attention to it. You didn't notice for ages. On a whim, I thought it would be fun to see if I could take the cat flapple mat, so I put it up my sleeve. Really? And then I rather forgot about it, until I found myself Mr. Windavang's shop of it later on. How do you forget that you have something like that? That you st you took something like that? Um, I, I see. And then... Ah! Mr. Sholmes, Mr. Sholmes. Leave me, Mr. Naruto. Right. After Mr. Naruto had left the shop, I started to think that the door started to play on my mind. That storeroom door, don't you mean? You mean? Yes. If Gina was anywhere in the shop, I realized it could only be behind that door. And at that moment, the little device that I had up my sleeve sprang to mind. I was so worried about Gina, I simply had to know... So, you used the cat flap mat to make the peephole in the door. As captured in a photographic print of the shop... ...by one of Hurley's red-handed recorders. Indeed, it was sort of the first importance at that point. Precisely when the peephole was made, that information would prove to be Mr. Naruto's greatest weapon. Though naturally, without proof, it would have been mounted to nothing. But when I looked through the hole in the door... The sight that met my eyes, uh, made my blood run cold. Thoughts started to run through my mind. I remembered that trial two months earlier. That trial of Magnus McGilded. I thought about how he had manipulated the evidence and arranged false testimony to secure his freedom. It made the British justice system feel very dark and sinister to me. 
And then, a terrible thought occurred to me. What if... What if some wicked criminal was planning to do the same thing now? Because from the appearance of the crime scene, it looked exactly as though Gina had shot Mr. Windebank. Even though I was sure she would never have done such a thing, you were worried that the true culprit would try to frame her for the crime. That's right. But then I realized... It would be very difficult for anyone to give false testimony in this case. What do you mean? Well, the crime appeared to have happened behind the door of a locked room. For someone to claim falsely to have witnessed it, there would have to be a way to see beyond the door. Ah. For which... A peephole would be the very thing. Only the peephole I'd made wasn't actually there until after the crime had been committed, of course. And the criminal would know that, so it wouldn't make any difference. But the possibility of a rather ingenious trap was there, was it not? Uh, a trap? Is that why she did it? So, is that why you kept it a secret, Susie? You never mentioned that you made the peephole to anyone, not even to the police. I know, and I knew at the time what I was doing was wrong, a criminal offense even. That's why I decided to confide in Mr. Sholmes. If Mr. Naruto uh, was completely backed into a corner with no other possible means of escape, the truth about the peephole could save him. That was my plan. She really does think of everything. So I was very smart on uh, Suzato-san's um, uh, planning. Why didn't you just tell me everything before the trial began? My dear fellow, you're not thinking straight. If she had done that, it would have rendered you complicit in the whole escape pad. Ah. You could have been disbarred if you had been seen to um, have knowingly tampered with a crime scene. So Mrs. Adams' son decided to shoulder the burden of responsibility alone. For your sake, and Miss Lestrade's. Miss Suzato. The truth is, when it happened, I did it because I'd lost a little of my faith in the law. Oh. I was worried about that r the right person wouldn't be convicted of the crime. But the moment I allowed myself to think that is the moment that I lost my right to call myself a judicial assistant. What you did isn't comparable to what he did. Graydon is the one who lied in the witness stand using that peephole as a way to implicate Gina. And besides, if the peephole inconsistency hadn't existed, I'm not at all sure that she would have been acquitted in the end. Mrs. Zato, what you did saved Gina's life. Well, with your kind words, Mr. Naruto, you've saved me too from my regrets. Well, we must at all be thankful uh, that Miss Lestrade's freedom has been assured. Yes, exactly. Although some of the loose ends in that trial will continue to play on my mind, I'm sure. But the revelation to the music box does contain secret messages, Mr. N Naruto. What a triumph to work that out. I'm full of admiration. Well, actually, that argument wasn't quite as compelling as I thought it was. Oh? It wasn't? There was a communications officer among the jury members, you see, a telegraph operator, and she said that the majority of the sounds in the disc were just meaningless tones. As one would expect, after all, we are talking about secret government communications. No doubt they were written in cipher to avoid being readily under understood should they have been in intercepted. In cipher, I, I see, that's another code. So then, we could never have hoped to understand the messages anyway. Nonsense, my dear fellow. It's quite a zero-pipe problem, I assure you. Uh, okay. Ah. Uh. So? J. What? A soji? Well, that can't be a real world word, can it? How funny. Wait. Iris, what did you just say? Oh, um, I just said a soji. Does that word mean something to you? Mean something? A soji was the name of my best friend. What? But how, how did you know that name, Iris? I wrote it down during the trial before, when the message was playing on the music box. What? She transcribed it on the fly. She really is genius. I thought the message properly wouldn't be written out in plain Morse code, so I tried various ways to interpret it. 
but whatever I, I tried, the words didn't seem to make any sense. That is, in English at least. Oh. It suddenly occurred to me, you see. There's more to, than one Morse code, not just the English variety. Various countries around the world have altered and added Morse code to use in their own languages. I don't believe it. As you are si are you saying... That's right. I've only actually seen a chart of Japanese Morse code once before, but I think it's based on the Iro ha pan pangram, isn't it? And you mean to say that in Japanese Morse code, the message says a soji? Yes, I think so. Sorry, but I don't remember all of the Japanese Morse code. Iris, would you let me see that? Miss Suzato, do you know it? Do you know Japanese Morse code? Yes, I spent some time studying it. What's that government information? Because I'm quite sure Morse code will become ever more important for the international communications. Oh, you have no idea, especially with World War One coming up, because this is before World War One. How much, how important Morse code is going to be? Then might I recommend, my dear madam, that you focus your efforts on the English version? Be that as it may, Iris, show me the message, please. Of course. But, but, what can this possibly mean? Whatever is that long sequence supposedly meaning those dots and dashes, it's made that color drain from susato sans face. There's no doubt that this message is written in Japanese Morse code. So the British Empire has been using Japanese for its secret communications? I don't understand the reason why, but... The message appears to be a list of four people's names. Four names? The first is... Keia Soji. That's Kazuma. Kazuma Soji, why? Why was his name on that disc? The second is a Shin. Shin, I don't recognize that name. The third is T. Gergeson, I don't know that. Gregson? It would seem Tobias Gregson is the third man on the list. And what's his name doing in a secret government communications as well? And the last name. What's the matter, Mrs. Zato? It's just so strange. So unexpected. Oh, what is it, Susie? Don't keep us in surprise. Don't tell me it's Ryu's name. The last name is... J. Wilson. What? That's Iris's dad? Wilson? John H. Wilson? You mean daddy? What is going on here? It says only J. Wilson, so I'm afraid I can't be sure. Then after the four names, it reads, if I translate from Japanese, that is all four. And that's the end of the message, or rather, the end of what you noted down, Iris. I just can't believe it. Who would ever have thought that those discs contain Japanese Morse code? Not to mention a strange list of some disturbingly familiar names. It would appear that this particular message is a communication of some kind between Great Britain and the Empire of Japan. So, Daddy could be in Japan then. Where Susie and Runo come from. Oh, well. Hmm, no. It's not very likely, really, is it? Her father's been murdered, she doesn't know that. I mean, there are thousands of people with the surname Wilson, and there must be lots of J's among them. Professor John H. Wilson, visiting professor of medicine at the Imperial Yumei University. But we can't tell Iris about that now, we just can't. This is so strange. Somehow, in solving the case of Mr. Windebank's uh, murder today, I feel like I've rolled back a boulder at the mouth of a very dark cave. I do wonder if perhaps it's a dark cave that we shouldn't go wandering inside. Probably not. What is these government secrets? Oh, there's her ship. Oh dear, the ship is going to set sail soon. Yes, it seems so. I'll sail on the steamship first to the port of Dunkirk in France. Then I'll change onto a larger passenger vessel bound for Japan. 
You're really going then, Susie. We wish you a safe passage, Miss Suzato. Thank you so much. I wish all of you the very best. Miss Suzato, I had hoped to have you always at my side to guide me and support me. Mr. Naruto, please come back soon. As far as I'm concerned, you really are the very best judicial assistant in the world. I'm, I'm quite sure I'll be back before you know it. Really, Susie. Oh, now don't forget, Iris. I made you a promise I've yet to fulfill. A promise? About your manuscript. Ah. Oh yes, the Hound of the Baskervilles. Well, I'll be waiting for you then, Susie. A promise is a promise. Definitely, Iris. Mr. Naruhado, um, Naruto, um, yes. Do you remember the first time we met? Yes, of course. On the SS Burio, when I was dragged out from that, um, wardrobe still half asleep. If I remember rightly, you threw me halfway across the cabin for Suzato takedown. You know very well that I'm talking about after that. It's strange, but being thrown together as we were in that case, I somehow felt straight away that you were the perfect person to continue Kazuma Sama's great legacy. Miss Suzato, and my instincts were right. I really want to believe. No, I'm sure that. I'll be back soon. Farewell until then. And so that's it for that case. Um, that is the fifth case in the first game. Now we're going to go on to the second game soon. Um... Somehow we seem to have come to the end of the adventures of Ryunosuke Naruhodo. Or the first volume, at least. Looking back now, it feels as though fate has led me on this journey. I've... Fate led me to becoming a lawyer, to traveling halfway around the world, to meeting the great detective. I'm sure there'll be trials and tribulations ahead. Of course there will. But whatever happens, I know I'll be able to turn my fortunes around. After all, I have the greatest friends in the world, on my side. They're definitely gonna make an anime out of this game one day. They made an anime of the original Ace Attorney, they'll probably make an anime out of the great Ace Attorney Chronicles too. Ah, yes, Mr. Naruhodo, um, so I keep saying it, Naruto or Naruhodo, that's the only, I, I, I learned how to pronounce his first name, Ryunosuke, but his last name, I'm still having trouble pr trying to figure out how to pronounce. Um, yes, Mr. Sholmes, I have some rather awkward news. What? The railway company has decided to sue over the special express train, apparently, huh? It's caused such a commotion in the line, all the other trains have to wait at stations. What does that mean? That we're stranded? But really, we would never have made it to Dover in time otherwise. Anyway, I explained everything and how it was all your fault. What? Huh? Huh? I believe a formal complaint should be delivered to your office tomorrow. But not to worry, my dear fellow. According to Miss Suzato, you love defending yourself in court. Huh? It's alright, I'm perfectly happy to testify. He really didn't look like the sort of man who would love um, to do something so outrageous. See? Um, Mr. Sholmes? Yes? A word, if you don't mind. Why, certainly, any word you like. Uh, bellow it out, my dear fellow. Oh yes, I love Runo's words, and I know just the one he'll use here. Then I really must say... Objection! 
So, um, uh, I'm gonna say, though, this isn't the end, though, guys. I know this looks like the end, but this isn't the end. Because there is, um, in the following weeks, hundreds of music boxes arrive at Baker Street from all over Europe. Something was afoot. Though it transpired, I'd ordered them all myself. So I advertised them for sale with used by Mr. Sholmes to solve an important case. And the money I've earned, consulting detective work, pays a pittance by comparison. So there's actually still a second game, so there's two games in this game, and we're gonna we're gonna start the second game uh, soon. Uh, I haven't slept a wink. This manuscript is due tomorrow now. When I'm in th this busy, Hurley usually cooks me breakfast. Well, cooks is an overstatement for some dry toast and in in uh, bed coffee. I do miss Susie and her lovely Japanese breakfasts. Witness, your testimony is real of contradictions. Exactly, rarely do rare Coben coins hide under rare ste steaks themselves. Well, Edo no son knows his father is an innocent man. Or are you calling my son a liar? Witnesses, my courtroom is no place for your petty arguments. <laughs> Having delivered the Russian dancer to shore in Shanghai, I laid low on the steamship for a while. But last night, I ap apprehended an extremely suspicious Japanese national on board. I've done nothing wrong. <laughs> All I did was give uh, Wagahai's offspring refuge in my pocket. A man brings some kittens on board, and suddenly, he's a hardened criminal. It's not fair. Oh man, he's had the worst luck ever. Scientific investigation will be the gold standard for policing in the new age. I dream of a world governed by the tenets of order and discipline. Like a great clock, in fact, whose hundreds of parts mesh together in perfect unison. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have but 2 minutes and 37 uh, seconds until my next appointment. The latest Rance magazine is out, and I'm in it again. I hope they wrote bad things. Whenever I see that one line she wrote now, I get a standing ovation. Want to hear it? Hmm. Not bad, I suppose. For an amateur. Her ladyship puts me to shame. That was a little epilogue on the characters. But there's still gonna be the second game, um... Oh, it's Garrett Depp. Been visiting the old girl on a daily basis, of course, joining my old jailbird. Must say, battling with those Bali stairs every day has done wonders for the, uh, Managing rather well with the housework, too. Got this maid business tapped up, I'd say. Hope the gossiping neighbors don't realize the man of the house is his own maid. I do like that, how they have a little epilogue for all the characters and what happened to them. Oh, these two. My Raleigh is the back of the beat again. All thanks to, uh, to the Reaper. There's nothing I enjoy more these days than hunting out small change in the gutter. I'm a better Bobby now, looking out for Londoners. They're dropped pennies and my uh, lovely wife. Oh, Pat, oh, Raleigh. Looks like I'm gonna be doing time for a bit now. But Iris comes every day for a natter, so it ain't too boring. She's always going on about all them cases what Sholmes is looking into. Criminal investigations are kind of interesting when you get into them. 
So she's serving time in, j in jail right now for the, um, uh, for lying in her previous testimony two months ago, and also for breaking and entering into the store. But she shouldn't be in there for too long. Oh, Graydon, yes. I renounced my upbringing and chose a life of sophisticated crime. But regrets? Please. Give over, bruv. That ain't the Ash we used to know. We got time in here to plan the comeback of Milverton and Skulking's milk run, right? The three musket, uh, musky what sits. Milk in the neighborhood for all it's worth. They're all in prison together. This past six months has been a time I shall remember forevermore. Painful goodbyes and wonderful encounters. I've come to realize that's what life is all about. Naruto san, I promise. Your assistant will return to you one day. But for now, I leave you with many memories and a heartfelt wish that life will treat you very well. I love this game so much. This is definitely my um uh this is definitely my favorite game of the year for 2021 is this one. I love this game so much. What is this here? The credits? More? Oh. There's more credits here. Voice actors. Well, they only had a few lines, but, you know, there's still voice actors. Um. But I'm gonna have the next part up for you guys as soon as I can. Um. So you're walking past all the characters right now in the game. Man, I, I like the credit sequence a lot in this game. Oh, and it's her, Brett. Oh man, that she was evil. I feel like we're gonna see her again. And Suzato and her father. That's the crew of the ship. Oh, that's the, um, the Russian girl. Trying to remember what her name was, um, but she was responsible for Kazuma's death. Oh, Suzato again. And she has a katana. Lord Strongheart, the, um, the police. There's London Square. Oh, it's Mr. Fairplay. The Hatter. Oh, and there's the Beppo, the driver. Oh, and there's McGilded. Man, I hate that guy McGilded so much.
There's Baker Street and Herlock Sholmes. Inspector Gregson. Pat and Riley, I believe. Garadeb and his wife. Natsume and his kitten. Iris. I wonder if we'll see the Reaper. Nope, oh, there he is. The Skulkin Brothers and Graydon. There's Gina. So, um, for people that are confused, um, this game has two games in it. Um, uh, it's The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles 1 and 2. And so, um, uh, this game came out in 2015, I believe in Japan, 2015. And what happened was, when the game came out, there was only a Japanese version. There was never an English version. And now, six years later, they released a, um, a, an English version of these games. And these games have gotten really popular. And so I love the Ace Attorney games, and these this was, you know, one game that I never got the chance to play because I don't speak Japanese. But um, uh, this, um, uh, you know, now that it's in English, we can play this game. And so that's it. That's it for the first game um, there. But we'll be playing the second game. Um, uh, we'll be playing the second game soon in the next part. So I still want to get through the second game for you guys. So I'm... Um, uh, uh, Man, it's a lot, a lot in this, this, this part was almost four hours. Man, this is my longest part of this. I'm sorry this part was so long, but I don't even want to divide this part into two parts because it'd be kind of weird when I, like, you know, put it into, like, you know, two parts of the trial, like, right when they're in the middle discussing something. Um, but look, there we go, and then we got the ocean now on the menu. So thank you guys for watching. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. I had so much fun playing this for you guys. I'll have the next part up for you guys as soon as I can. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everyone.